mystery con uh, conference called Killer Nashville. And mm. I did that, I guess, maybe five years ago. Yeah. Was, yeah. Killer yeah. Nashville. Yeah, it's, it's like mystery Tom, right Tom or something, but with yeah. horror movies and mystery and stuff. Well, mostly, I think it's mostly writers did like books. Um, I, okay. Quite honestly, I don't know. More of a literary type thing. Yeah, exactly. To, to the degree that mystery writers write uh, literature. But I always think it's sort of obnoxious to, uh, I don't know. I, I don't consider that what I do is, is literature. I consider what I do is entertainment. Is entertainment? Well, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's no apology in that at all. Yeah. I mean, re reading is a form of entertainment. There's it sure is. No doubt about it. So you could definitely be categorized that way. Very good. So all you right. ready? You have any more questions for me? You ready to do this? You ready yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Head first. <laughs> so I do do this segment. It's called the Jack Wagon Train. Um, it's for fun. And I'll just, I'll explain it when we get to it. So. Okay. All right. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll, you'll flow and fit in just fine. So. All right, Leadheads, welcome back to another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. This is your host, Lefty, and I've got a great show lined up for you Leadheads today, especially for you uh, thriller literary lovers. Uh, we've got Mr. John Gilstrap, and he is the author, I'm sorry, the New York Times bestselling author. Let me let me throw that in there. Yeah, well, <laughs> try awards. to get it right. Well, yeah, I mean, come on. Come on, and, and he's he's won a few awards along the way. Uh, with his Jonathan Grave uh, thriller series, uh, and your new, is it uh, Elizabeth Emerson? Victoria Emerson. Victoria Emerson, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, type series. And I know we, a lot of our listeners are really into that that genre, uh, and I know that you like to distinguish it from the zombie post-apocalyptic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was funny when we were, when I was first pitching this idea to my publisher. And I said, and, and I explained it as post-apocalyptic because commercial fiction, everything has to be in a genre. Yeah. And I said, oh my God, no, you can't do it because that means monsters and zombies now. I, so, but, there, <laughs> but there's, not, there's not another word for something after the apocalypse that is just humans. So right. this is the just humans type. This is what the actual post-apocalyptic means. This is a real post-apocalyptic type scenario. Where there's right. There's not going to be the Walking Dead going on. No, no, <laughs> so, no. God. No. And we want to we want to learn more about your your books, uh, your characters. Uh, we want to learn more about you uh, as a person, John, and being a two A advocate. I know our listeners are going to be very excited to to hear about that aspect of your life. Uh, former firefighter, EMT, explosive expert. Uh, we're going to learn about all that. Uh, about Mr. Gilstrap coming up. So, uh, but before we do that, John, we've got to be able to take our sponsors, you know, the people that make this happen, because we don't run on thanks on this show. <laughs> it takes, it takes money, and sponsors like Keltec, as you can see, I'm wearing here my nice new Keltec T-shirt. And if you lead heads want to get some Keltec apparel swag, you can go to their website, KeltecWeapons.com, and you use the code Leadhead. And they're going to give you 15% off. That is our first discount code that we've had set up with uh, Keltec. I don't think they've ever set one up with anybody before. And it's not weapons. You can't buy their guns. They don't sell their guns on their website. But any of their apparel, swag, stuff like that, you can get. They used to have flashlights on there and knives. I don't know if they still have all that. But they've got cool stuff. Uh, go check them out, KeltecWeapons.com. Uh, and then, of course, Mission First Tactical. You familiar with Mission First Tactical, John? I am not. I'm certainly familiar with Keltec. Yeah. So Mission First Tactical makes all kinds of AR-15 accessories. So if you're building your AR-15 or you need magazines, uh, they can put custom cool logos on their magazines. Their magazines are really good. They're 30 round AR magazines. They got AR-10 magazines also. Um, but we had some printed up with our Leadhead Brigade logo. And uh, you guys can go to Mission First Tactical. You can get the Talking Lead logoed uh, items, or you can get your own cool logo put on there if you want to. Uh, Mission First Tactical. Are you allowed to have 30-round magazines in your state, John? We sure are. Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll get your address after, and I'll send you some. All right. Thank you very much. I will hook you up with that. 
Uh, and then, of course, the famous dump trays at Mission First Tactical, where you can have custom print jobs on those. We've got our AK corner on the one for our video audience that are looking uh, at the video now. We use these for our armorer's tray also, John. Um, if you're gunsmithing, working on your guns, you can put all your small parts and uh, all that while you're cleaning or you're building. Uh, it's a great little uh, tray for that. Holds up perfect because this is inked. This ink is injected in there, and it's not just on the on the top, so uh, it won't come off. Uh, Mission First Tactical, use the code LEADHEAD, and you're going to get 20% off at Mission First Tactical. And then as we were talking about, I don't know if you're one of those people who like to clean your guns or not, John, but I, I bet you are. Yeah. Seal 1, uh, CLP Plus, uh, and we're going to be giving one of these away to one of our listeners today. So one of you lucky listeners that participated in our questions for John, uh, we're going to be giving away one of these awesome Seal 1 CLP packs. Um, green engineered, safe for the environment, safe for you. Uh, and it also works really good on your guns, keeping them clean and for your accuracy. Um, if you want to learn more about how to use it for increasing the accuracy in your firearm, get in touch with me or go to seal1.com. And you can get information there, but go to their website and use the code LEADHEAD and get 25% off SEAL 1. So there you go. We got that out of the way. <laughs> That's a lot of good stuff. That That is good stuff. And we've got more. We've got a lot more discount codes that we're going to give out throughout the show uh, for our LEADHEADS. We like to uh, reward our listeners. So more so than, you know, we're getting something, our, our listeners are getting something as well. And you too. You're welcome to use those codes too, John. So feel okay. free. Okay. All right. But like I said, I'm going to hook you up with some stuff. So we'll get your your contact info after the show and, and hook you up with some stuff. Uh, before we get into learning more about John, um, we do this segment. John, it's called the Talking Lead Jack Wagon Train. They call it the Planes and Trains segment because we we take care of some people that we don't necessarily agree with, and then we also honor some people that we think are doing some good in our our community. So, and the the gunny, I know you know who the gunny was. Oh yeah, he does the intro for our jack wagon train. So, gunny, bring that train in. Hey, Ralph, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at eighth and I. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week. So brace yourself, baby. <laughs> All right, the train has station, John, and we're going to take care of some some jack wagons. And I know you have no idea what I'm talking about. At not a clue, but this not will be a clue, fun. But I think you're going to catch on once I, I get into it here. So we've got uh, some listeners submitted jack wagons, and I'm going to go to one right now. And this one is from Leadhead Jeff, Jeff Haddix. He said, jack wagon nomination, California Assembly member Jim Cooper stopped by airport security with loaded gun and carry-on baggage. So, and he's got a link here to an article, but he says, hey, Lefty, I proudly nominate, and I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Here we go. My state assemblyman, Jim Cooper, retired Sacramento County Sheriff deputy, current candidate for Sacramento County Sheriff, as he has lost once or twice. Uh, assemblyman Cooper had a loaded handgun by TSA at the Sacramento International Airport in his carry-on bag a few days ago. This jack wagon is a sponsor of a bill banning homemade guns. That's what they call the ghost guns. Mm -hmm. uh, homemade guns. Has voted for red flag laws, a resolution for Congress members to not conceal carry to the Capitol, limiting the purchasing uh, of firearms, increase in firearm purchasing fees, requiring the DOJ to supply information to the California Firearms Violence Research Center. This is just where he came down on the wrong side of the Second Amendment, uh, and a few he just didn't vote for at all. Many local news outlets state that he was given the firearm back after his return to the airport, stating he was a retired law enforcement. Uh, he's allowed to do that, have it on the grounds, but he can't go through security. I myself am a retired police officer, uh, thank you for your service, Mr. Haddix. Uh, in one of uh, once in the Golden State, so in California. But I seriously doubt I would have been given the same treatment. Probably not. Uh, keep the great content coming for another 10 years. And we're celebrating our 10 years of talking lead, John. This is our 10 year anniversary of, of educating 
the uneducated. <laughs> Did I lose you? So John's working on his audio here. I think he hit a wrong button. I'll give you a minute here. Nope. Don't hear you. Did something come unplugged? No. Just went out? I, I can't hear you. See your lips moving. Sometimes I can read lips. <laughs> I don't think that's going to do good for our audience, though. <laughs> try this. Try hanging up and then calling back in. Sometimes that will reset it. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Well, mine mine goes up to 11, so. It <laughs> goes up to 11. I can only count it. I only have 10 fingers. Yeah. That's all I can do. So we're going to try to recapture the momentum here. <laughs> uh, I kept it going. I kept it going while you were gone. So oh, okay. welcome, welcome back. Uh, I thank you. I, I, a little trip out to limbo. It's kind of scary out there. It's cold being, and dark. We're being spied on. Yeah. The government spying on us. They didn't want us talking because they knew we were going to make great things happen today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we took care of that jack wagon um, that I was talking about there. Did you have any comments on that? I uh, wanted want to say anything about the oh, well now now I know what a jack wagon is and the there you and, go and and definitely uh, we call it a moron where I come from or a moron um, yeah it, it's uh, maroon it's, bugs and bugs. when I when I consider how many pocket knives I have submitted to TSA over the years uh, <laughs> it 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 kind of angers me oh yeah no doubt I, I got a story on that though. Well, let's hear it. Okay. A buddy of mine, a writer buddy of mine, was going through TSA, and he realized he had a, a really good knife clipped to his pocket, you know, yeah. like a Benchmade sort of thing, and he'd already checked his luggage. And he wasn't just going to hand it over to TSA, and he was running late on his flight, so he didn't know what to do. So he went to the bookstore in the airport, and he put the knife behind, like, Jane Eyre, you know, some one of the, the, the classic books. He was gone for a week and a half. He came back and the knife was still there because nobody reads those books. So. <laughs> He's like, nobody's going to touch this book. It's got dust on it. It's exactly. <laughs> That's smart thinking. Yeah, I thought that was really good. That's smart thinking because otherwise you got to either um, leave, mm -hmm. with, try to go take it back to your car, uh, or you like you said, you donate it to TSA. and That's just something that they're going to put in their pocket and you know, score for them. And I was at a gun show a couple months ago, and the um, there's a there's a vendor that buys those from TSA and then sells them at the show. So oh, you, yeah. So I mean, so TSA is making money off of these things. That kind of pisses me off. Absolutely, they are. Why wouldn't they? It's the government, right? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, TSA, they're they're a government contractor, I guess. Mm -hmm. So they're in, they're just in it to win it for themselves. So they'll take anything and everything they can. For that reason, like you said, they're making money off of it. Jack wagons, definitely. So that's good. That's a good jack wagon. So TSA. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the to the jack wagon tray, TSA. <laughs> so I was also talking about a hero um, that I wanted to nominate. And uh, I was getting into the story about um, SpaceX. I was like, I don't necessarily uh, support the people that are behind SpaceX, but I, I do support what the ultimate goal and what SpaceX is trying to do. And they just had a, a launch recently. Um, well, let's see if it's got a date on when this happened. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launches just like March 9th. So that's today. Yeah. That was today. This launched today. So this was today as of... This morning, it says the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket boosted the company's latest batch of Starlink Internet satellites to low Earth orbit Wednesday, but not before launch engineers poked fun at Russia's recent comments on U.S. space vehicles. And here's a quote. It's time to let the American boomstick fly and hear the sounds of freedom. So, I kind of like that. SpaceX launch engineer Julia Black called out just before 8.45 a.m. Eastern. So that's that's probably why I didn't uh, hear about it. I wasn't up yet. 
Uh, from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, launch director is go for launch. So that's just kind of like been a childhood thing of mine, John. Ever since I was young, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Um, so I got my degree in, in aerospace growing up. Uh, did a little piloting and, and whatnot. Uh, but I never got as far as getting into any kind of space program. So I always like to keep close ties on NASA and SpaceX and uh, – What's the the other guy, Elon Musk? What, mm-hmm. Is he SpaceX or? I think he is SpaceX. Who's the other one, the Amazon guy? Oh, yeah. He's, um, he's got one Bezos. too. Bezos. Bezos. Yeah, Bezos. He's got some sort of space program going too. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I like to see our our efforts to to reach out into the stars continuing. So uh, SpaceX. And, and necessarily not SpaceX, but Julia Black with her comment, time to let the American boomstick fly and hear the sounds of freedom. I like that. That's a great quote. I'll tell you, as a guy who used to be, well, it used to be aerospace. I used to be aerospace, but on the, on the propulsion side of things. Mm-hmm. I have nothing but respect for the technology. The fact that they can recover their boosters on a floating little deck out yeah. in, in the water and have it, have it, come it down land. vertically yeah that's that's a lot of technology right there that's it just it's amazing it's amazing how how far we've come I mean, look at what it took though it took getting the civilian market into it to mm-hmm. do this. you know and that that's where the government needs, needs to let go i mean it just goes to show that the more government interference we have with crap the the less what's the word i'm looking for red tape not red not necessarily red tape but uh, advancement that we have so we we could have advanced a whole lot further in our endeavors to space had they turned it over to the uh, civilian market decades ago decades well, I, as kennedy would say you know the back in the 60s when people were strapping themselves to icbms that's what the mercury program was yeah. just a new i think that you got to give props to the government for that. Then it got bloated and fat, and uh, and like so many government programs went yeah. out of control. But I don't. I think that the the progress through midway through the Apollo program. I don't know that with, without the participation of the government and the billions of dollars from the government, I don't yeah. think there would have been a civilian market. But there comes a point in any government program where the the well civilian oversight is is a given. Sure. But civilian industrial uh, participation makes things work oh, a I lot see. better. But Martin Marietta, you know, was involved in, I, I shouldn't go too far off my skis here, but on the LEM program and, and the various elements of the Apollo program were yeah. developed and designed by free enterprise under contracts to the government. So, you know, a lot I, of government oversight. A lot of government oversight. Well, it was a NASA program. Yeah. So, it, it was, no, I mean, it wasn't really a civilian, you know, type program, but they did bring in some civilian muscle power, we'll say. Right, right. Yeah. Very good. So that that's my hero. Do you have a hero? Do you have any heroes you want to you wanna nominate for a well, lead first one ride? Right now, right at this particular moment in time, yes, I do. It is my West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. I think that, you know, here's a guy – um, my, my politics run to the right quite a bit. And, you know, here's a guy from, well, it used to be a deep blue state. Now it's the blue went away from them. So it's, it's getting to be a deep red state, but here's a guy who's voting his conscience against his caucus and holding fast. And, you know, I, so yeah, he's, he's my hero for, for the moment. Joe, man, I'm going to share my screen. I, I have this ability, uh, John. I was going to pull him up here. Joe Manchin, there he is. Mm-hmm. And he is West Virginia? Yeah. Up in West Virginia. There he is. Now, is he, has he got anything uh, in particular that he's doing right now? That he's trying to push and promote. Well, he was the lone holdout uh, in the Democrat. Well, he and uh, Kristen Sinema were the lone holdouts that blocked the gargantuan spending plan and uh, the, the the Build Back Better uh, thing that was going to get rammed through the Senate. 
uh, as it ran through the house. And he alone stood and said, no, it's not the right thing to do. And he took a, took a lot of crap for it from yeah. his fellow Democrats. Very good. So welcome to Lead Force One, Joe Manchin. Definitely. What about a jack wagon? You got any more jack wagons? You know, in my line of work, where you got a lot, selling, <laughs> but it, it never is never a good idea to call them out. Um, well, but, yeah, I understand that. You don't have to name names. You can just be like, "There's this group of people <laughs> that, that do this certain thing." <laughs> <laughs> there's this there's this group of people who who believe that by shutting off sources of energy, we will just stop using fossil fuels and 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 do other things. Um, it's it's foolish. You know, the Greens are. You know, I've been in the environmental business for a long time, but it just it just doesn't work. I think um, the amount of the amount of um, these are troubling times from a, I want to say a liberty standpoint, because that just sounds too over the top, but it just, there's a real effort on the part of many people to control what I say, not me personally, but what, what we say is being said. Yeah. What, yeah. And, it's being disseminated. And if, and it's the, the narrative being shut down, the opposing narrative being shut down, uh, and canceled, as as they say. I just, I think these are really troubling times, and and the folks who are on the wrong side of history are all jack wagons. Yeah, definitely. You know, and and I think you were onto the right path there when you said liberty, because that is a freedom, freedom of speech, which freedom of speech is being squelched mm -hmm. by, by by certain entities, and we all know who we're talking about. The, you know, the the big social media giants that are out there, the news media giants that are out there and you know they're pushing and promoting their narrative versus what is actual and mm -hmm. you know we're, we're preaching to the choir here our listeners definitely understand that but it's good to know that you're on that side of things too so i think you just won some some hearts there with that one john good oh, i'm very very solidly on on that and i, I don't know this is sort of a free-form conversation but i think one of the things <laughs> the we, we talk about liberty and freedom of, you know, all these things being the First Amendment. And then the the Third Amendment and the is is protects us from quartering troops in our homes, which hasn't been relevant for a while. And then the Fourth Amendment is unreasonable search and seizure. And then it goes on from there, how, how to be treated when in prison. It, it is no accident that the Second Amendment is the one that falls right between the first and the third. You know, right. back in back in the 18th century, the, the concern was the abu abuse of power and the, the o government entities overriding the rights of individuals. Mm -hmm. So the, the Second Amendment sits there very significantly. And the, it's an argument I've always wanted to make, but never been able to. So when you talk about liberty and the protection of liberty, and whenever we're in a position where opposing thought doesn't matter how obnoxious the opposing thought is right. uh, it it needs to be heard everybody has a right to be heard and and to have those rights protected especially by the people who disagree with them right and that's the problem is that we have the right the right exists but it's not being protected right correct too many it's only being protected right. on one side <laughs> right correct we'll put it that way uh but that is a great point that you that you bring up, and I don't guess I've really heard anybody uh, argue it that way with the Third Amendment as well, because a lot of I guarantee you, ninety eight percent of the people out there can't tell you what the Third Amendment is. So uh, it makes perfect sense when you say freedom of speech, Second Amendment, uh, you know, to own firearms, protect ourselves from a tyrannical government, um, and then the Third Amendment to keep the government. Uh, from coming in and taking over your property to house their, you know, their their soldiers, basically just seizing your property when they want right. to. So, yeah, that's a great point. I like that. Very good. So I don't think we've got any more listener. I'm going to go to that post because I asked them to put uh, jack wagons on that post too. I'm just going to check it real quick. Um, make sure there's not any there. And as we go through, 
there's never a bad time to throw somebody on the jack wagon train or honor a hero. So as we go through and something pops up, uh, we can definitely take care of them. There's no time limit on that. I'm not seeing any on the post at, at the moment. So, okay. I got, a, I got another hero for it just because oh, this yeah. is something it's, it's rare that as an author, I, I don't, I don't get the opportunity to have discussions like this very often in, in, an environment like this. And one of the things that I, I think it's lost when we talk about heroes, usually we talk about individuals or classes of individuals and, and there's the, the valorous heroes, the ones who give up their lives and, and, and go into violent situations or into unsafe situations. But I wanna have a shout out for the, the people throughout this, this country who go to work every day in a job that they don't particularly like or that is dangerous, or it's a job that I wouldn't want to have. And they do it every day because it's the thing they need to do to protect their families. They're never gonna be famous for it. They're never gonna be rich for it, but they do it uh, because that's the right thing to do in order to keep their families going. And I, that is, that's the root of America, I think. That's oh, absolutely. The, we are built off of of people who live their lives in a small way. That doesn't mean they're small people. I, don't take me wrong. Oh, no, not but, at all. But they're not seeking fame or fortune. They they just want to go on, and and you know, and they're have, not seeking handouts. No, they don't seek yeah, handouts. It's, it's, they're not looking to the go, for, to the government to to get ahead to help them, you know, make it through a, a difficult time. You know, they. They want the opportunity to be to do that on their own, be able to right. do it themselves. Yeah. And I, I worry that they get forgotten by, certainly they, they've been forgotten by the media, but who cares about the media? But yeah. they're, they've been forgotten by politicians, even the politicians that represent them. Um, and I, and it, that's, that's upsetting. Hello? Sorry. That's okay. Speaking of jack wagons. <laughs> I tried to find where my phone is so it doesn't go off now. <laughs> and it won't even hang up. All right. Phone maintenance, my bad. So this phone, I don't know. I, I, I use, because uh, I hate Apple. Uh, again, I told you I'm a, a nonconformist. I hate Apple. I will never use anything Apple. So I'm using one of these Android phones. I've got a Samsung something or another. But it works when it wants to. <laughs> so trying to turn my volume down right now. Not working. There it goes, finally. I guess I was the last person on the planet to learn that uh, AT&T was going to stop servicing 3G phones, as if I know what that means. Yeah. And... Um, so one day last week, I just stopped being able to, being able to make phone calls. Nothing. Oh, really? Yeah. So I went, took it to the store, and they said, that phone's five years old. It's too old. You have to get a new phone. <laughs> I said, okay. What? Yeah. Uh, talk about uh, jack wagons, the, the utility companies, the phone, the internet. They're just, they're bullies. They're absolute bullies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's no, there's really no control over them and they can do what they want. So if they say oh, your phone's a, a year old and, oh, well, we're not going to service it anymore, then no, well, too bad. You got to get thousand dollars or sign on to another two year plan or some bullshit like that. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I, I definitely hate that. Uh, a bane of my existence is the cell phone. Absolutely hate it. <laughs> it got away with the times where you could actually hide that's well, true. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I also think I, I also think they make things more complicated. I've got a few years on you, but the um, not many, I would say the <laughs> the the need to respond immediately to anything, whether it's it's happy birthday or hey, get your car out of my yard. Uh, that that drive to respond instantly, which is uh, exacerbated by the presence of the phone because it's always with you, that means you, it's a lot of ill-considered responses. 
you yeah. give that quick emotional response that just makes things worse instead of taking the time to stew on it and sit down and you know well maybe think things through yeah i'm i'm kind of the the same way and i've gotten to that instant instant gratification instant response uh the, you know the pavlov dog kind of thing where they've conditioned me for this and if i send somebody a message and i don't get you know a response back and i i try to be reasonable about it you know 10 20 minutes <laughs> then, <laughs> you know then i'm starting to worry it's like did i piss this person off did i did i do something to upset them you know you, all these things start going through your mind and then and then you just like i'll just call them <laughs> so then you're like calling you're like hey why didn't you respond back? You're like, I'm at the doctor's, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so you feel like an asshole for that. But yeah, definitely. Uh, but they have conditioned us and they have done it well. They they definitely there was a plan in place with this uh this whole internet, this whole cell phone, um, the Instagrams, you know, it the name says it, uh, you know, it's so Instagram. Everything's instant and, and meant to be that way. Yeah. We, well, and then and then it drives people. You have all of these these videos, the, you know, phone videos that people are taking of horrific things being done. Whether it's somebody beating a dog or or beating another person or robbing a store or whatever, it's the same thing you could be using to call nine one one. But instead of actually oh calling my God. help, yeah. you're filming the damn thing. Yeah. I, I find this unconscionable. It's like somebody's getting beat in the middle of the street, and all these people are there videoing it instead of. It, jumping in and assisting and helping like you know any rational person would as long as you're physically capable or calling the police or someone to assist they're just sitting there video hoping that they're going to get that you know right. the uh, what is it called go viral they want them to go viral kind of deal so. but let's try to make you go viral on this show today john okay let's that. do that i think it's i think we're doing plan. it I think your numbers are up already. I think they're going up and up and up. Uh, you're hitting all the uh, all the right tick marks. So uh, we're going to get the jack wagon train out of here. We've taken care of enough jack wagons and, and honored some heroes there. And we want to learn more about you, John Gilstrap, the author. Uh, and then we're going to learn more about you, the person. So tell us about uh, your literary works and how you got involved with with the novels from with your background of being a firefighter and EMT explosive expert, uh, how does that transition into, into becoming a thriller novelist? Well, I didn't realize till after the fact that it was on the job training to become a thriller novelist. You know, at, 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 yeah. while I was doing those, those, uh, the, those careers, that was what I was doing. Uh, the firefighter EMT thing was a, uh, I was with a volunteer fire department that ran 14,000 calls a year. And in, in Northern Virginia, Prince William County, Virginia. Wow. And at that, while I was doing that in weekends and evenings and holidays and all of that, I was also the explosives, uh, excuse me, I was a safety, uh, head of the safety department for explosives manufacturer. And <clears throat> we did Stinger missile, multiple launch rocket system. We did Navy standard missile. We did, we were second on the, on the, um, shuttle space shuttle we never actually did a full up but we were second on that no this was uh the company was called atlantic research which okay. then became i don't think it exists in any form anymore after it's been bought and split up and all of that but at the time this was in the 80s uh the reagan years and you know you couldn't make enough uh weaponry in, oh, in yeah. the reagan years so that was a really great time Our and, words. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what that people don't realize that the uh, uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, which is what Star, Star Wars, yeah. that, that killed the Soviet Union. There, oh, absolutely. It, that was a key player in all of that. And there was some really, really cool technology and yeah. some really hot propellants. Soviets uh, were shaking in their boots with the They were. Star they Wars. were. And, um, but anyway, it, it, I've always been a writer. I've always been, I've always written stories in, on on the side, it's just something. It's like tinkering with a car. You know, I would I would write stories, and you know, I was the explosives business led to the hazardous waste business, which led to a consulting business, and all the time I was I was writing. And finally, on my fourth book, the first three were just you know practice novels. I enjoyed doing them, but I never thought they were any good. 
Uh, my uh, fourth book was called Nathan's Run. Uh, wrote it in 94, came out in 96, and it was a worldwide bestseller. I mean, it was... What was that about? That was about a 12-year-old boy, uh, Nathan Bailey, who kills a juvenile detention center guard hmm. um, while incarcerated and runs away. And he becomes the the, the focus of this well, it's not nationwide, it was in Virginia, so a regional uh, manhunt because he's a cop killer. You know, he, he killed a guard. Yeah. And people are calling for his head and he sort of becomes, the media runs with it and, and he becomes this really evil kid. What nobody knows is that he killed in self-defense and he ends up uh, calling into a radio show. The Denise Carpenter is the name of the character. She calls herself The Bitch. That's her radio name, The <laughs> Bitch of Washington, D.C. And she's syndicated... <laughs> <laughs> and and he calls in and tells his side of the story, and then suddenly it, it things change. So that's that's that was the first thriller, and it so, was translated into twenty three languages, and it, was, it was, and so suddenly, um, and not to be you know, it, the paycheck was really good for that, and uh, so then it sort of made sense to be a writer. Yeah, you're like, hey, this actually can pay some bills. I might yeah. write another one of these things, huh? So here I am, twenty-four books later. So did uh, did so? You're a child of the seventies, eighties. Uh, well, sixty late sixties, seventies. Late sixties, seventies. Um, I'm I was born in seventy-one, so I'm seventies, you eighties. Know, did you ever watch the movie Logan's Run? Oh yeah, uh huh. Yeah, Which, that, it's nothing that, like that. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing like that. It was Nathan, when every time I was reading about it, I was like Nathan Drun. I, Logan Drun immediately came to mind every time I, I was thinking well, about that. When it came out, I, I took heat for um, Logan's Run and is it about a hot dog stand? Because Nathan's <laughs> hot dogs was a really big deal right there. Oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> that's lame. Uh, but you actually had a, a movie option on that. Book, that right? I did actually. We sold it outright to um, in a bidding war between started with seven studios and came down to Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers, and um, that closed about ten o'clock at night on March first, nineteen ninety five, with this wild three part conference call between my film agent, which I didn't even know I had, and my <laughs> literary agent and. And and us, my wife and I, sharing a, a phone like they're, they're like eight extensions in the house. Extensions that one you just got rid of. Yeah, <laughs> extensions were when phones plugged into the wall, right? It, because we didn't have the cell phone stuff, so the you had landline. That's right. Um, I didn't even know if he called it that because it wasn't an alternative. Uh -uh. It, was just, it was just the phone. The phone. It was yeah. just the phone then. So, weird. so that went and um, and then the next book was at all costs. Then sold the movie rights for that too. And it was, so it was a. Um, so have it, they made a, a Nathan's Run? Absolutely not. Um, I have been involved with seven film projects. Actually, I'm working on an eighth film project. Um, hopefully, the eighth one will work, but the other seven will. It, it, I, it pays well, but it doesn't mean you yeah. ever actually see anything on the screen. So, so for a studio to to come hot and heavy after that, and then not make. Uh, a movie? Have they made anything similar to it, or no, not really? No, nothing. No, because it's what like happens. What great. happens is Hollywood doesn't. There's one person in Hollywood that reads a book, and then they write what's called coverage. So it, it's a junior staff or a twenty-something um, who will read the book and then boil it down for the producers with a recommendation: should we go for it or not? And in the '90s, Hollywood was throwing stupid money at. at of projects. Everybody had a uh, had a production deal. Every star had a production deal. So the the appetite for material was huge. So um, they they buy the book, but then you have to have a screenwriter who writes the script that's based on the book. And the screenwriters that they chose for for mine, I I, I, just, I just don't think they were very good. I mean, the the places where they changed the script made took all the heart out of the story. Now it's my story, so of course I have. My, my opinions are probably not the clearest. Um, but by the time it was done, the people who at, at the senior levels never read the book. They just read the script. And if they don't like the script, then they put it on the shelf and they got so much money to spend. It doesn't matter. Right. Now, is there a way to resuscitate that and 
and bring it back to life, or is that just that's shelved and never see the light of day again? It's what's it's in what's called turnaround. So if there are movie producers out there, um, yeah. it, it, yes, I mean you can buy it away from uh, Warner Brothers, but they've got a couple million dollars stacked against it now or more. Yeah. Um, so before you do anything, you have to pay an obscene amount of money just to get the rights back. Right. And Hollywood being what it is, if 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 a big name producer, you know, if a Spielberg, you know, some big name uh, producer yeah. or director took an interest in it, <clears throat> they might- Aims Warner, gun. Warners might not let go of it because it's humiliating for a, if another studio makes a hit out of a movie they chose not to make. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of moving parts in in, in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just it kind of sucks for you because you know that's your baby, and mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure you would love to see it, you know, on the screen. And you know, the, as gangbusters as Netflix is, and you know, all these streaming services now, I think there's probably been a revitaliz revitalization of that. You know, just buying up books and movie rights and, you know, things like that to fill the content, especially after this pandemic crap. You know, there's right. a gap, big void there uh, of where they weren't filming for a lot of the the time there. Um, I would well, like I, to see I would like to see it come back to life because it sounds like it'd be a really good like a Netflix series. That'd be like a good Netflix series. They could do a. Your your lips to God's ear. You know, I have hope. My Jonathan Grave series, which I, I think I'm on my 15th book in, in that. It's about a freelance hostage rescue specialist, a, a, a former Delta operator who has this. It's really about the. Well, he he blows things up and and, you know, makes big <laughs> holes in the world to, to yeah. do what he's doing, but always for the forces of good. You know, he's like he's this guy has a very strong moral compass. And when he agrees that he's going to rescue uh, a good guy from a bad guy, he's, he's going to do it. The guy's coming home. Yeah. Um, he, might, he might be in a bag, but he's coming home. And that, that's his sole mission. And of course, there's, he's often asked to do things by the government the government can't actually do. He's best friends with the director of the FBI, a lady named Irene Rivers. Um, so that's, that's a really fun series, she I think. Uh, he thinks she is. <laughs> I've never actually seen her. <laughs> so a a freelance hostage rescue specialist is that a is that a real thing? Do those exist? Um, I am aware of some who do. I don't know that that's an actual job title, but yeah. sure, there there are um, freelancers that um, who is the um, Ross Perot uh -huh. back in the day um, uh, sent with was it to Iran? It was a long time. It was before my political awareness, uh -huh. um, but. Yeah, there there are folks who will send their teams in to to save people. Oh, it just happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, you know when we when we abandoned all those people and we had individuals going in yeah. on cover of night. So that is that's kind of the so more along the, that that type stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I was I'm familiar with the Ross Perot. Um, so these rich guys put together these teams to go in and and do these specialized missions to bring home whatever right. maybe it's one of their employees or maybe it's it's whatever but you've got 15 books in the uh jonathan grave series already yes well i'm writing number 15 now so 13 are out the 14th called lethal game comes out in june and oh. and i'm writing number 15 and i'm i don't know what it's about yet but by god i'm writing it so so and, and you know and i know that a character you know literary character is is your bread and butter and is he aging through these? No. Is he, is he, so it's it's like a certain span of like ten years of his life or something like that. Or no, it it's and it's not really a series. It's a it, they're standalone books with a recurring character. Yeah, if that if that makes sense. No, I think it's yeah, kind of okay. like James Bond. Yeah, kinda. And, his books are they're all standalone basically. Right. And, you know, Tony Darmond has been president of the United States in my series since 2009. Um, it, it's just it's cleaner that way. And it also allows me to. 
to tackle. I don't write politics. That's not what I do. But there are there are yeah. social issues and such that that make any book interesting. Right. And if I if I keep the political class locked, then I think it's easier reading for everybody, whoever whoever feel bruised. Right. If if the ideology was, stays the same throughout. Exactly. The exactly. And it's always incompetent. You know, the, the Washington establishment under Tony Darmond administration, we know that he's he's weak and he's incompetent. And if he wasn't, then Jonathan wouldn't have as much to do right. from my perspective. Right. Yeah. So so I think it's it's easier for me just to lock the, the character down in age. And I've never mentioned how old he is. I've never said what he looks like. Really? You never yeah. described him? Nope. And I and I hear from fans. Everybody wants to cast the movie. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I want to see this on the screen and I'm seeing Chris Pratt or, you know, whoever playing this. It, part. Yep. And, and Bradley Cooper's a big one as someone, Bruce Willis, I think is a little past his door kicking. Yeah. Side. But, um, he's had his time. What's interesting is that the readers bring the visual themselves. So, I don't want to get in the way. So I think it's it's silly. We know that Jonathan is Jonathan Grave is he's a really moral guy. He's an ethical guy. He's a lethal guy. Um, he's funny. Um, he has a big heart. He loves dogs. <laughs> um, you know, so and he's also a philanthropist. Speaking of, didn't you just get a new puppy? I did get a new puppy. Her name is Kimber. Kim. And 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 yeah, she's oh, a sweet. Come on, can you come up with a better name than Kimber? <laughs> right. That's well, so it's, actually, it's it's my wife's dog technically, although I I've, I've pretty much fallen in love. Uh, we're getting a lab, and and Kimber is a little bitty thing. Um, yeah. She'll maybe be fourteen pounds. Kind of spaniel grown. breed. It's a King Charles uh, spaniel with a Boston Terrier. It's called a Caviston, and just she's she's delightful. Uh, but she will have a sister from an entirely different set of parents that'll be a Labrador retriever named Ruger that will come and join us in June. Oh, we got to work with you on your names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Caltech just loved the product. <laughs> it's just not a great name. It's just not a great name. Well, you could go Kelgren. Kelgren's a good <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you, you could use the actual name, Kelgren, but uh, you're just Gucci with the Kimber and the... Yeah. The, well. You're just going Gucci. That's okay. That's okay. And here's so, the thing. It's not, I'm not a 1911 platform guy. I just, I'm not, I'm a striker fire guy, but, yeah. but Joy, my wife wanted, what's a good girl? <laughs> I'm just digging this deeper and deeper. Dude, it's a good, <laughs> no, it's a good name. I'm just busting yeah, your chops. Yeah, yeah. I like all guns. You know, I like anything that goes boom. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a, a racist when it comes to guns <laughs> or sexist. How, however, they're, they're, classified i don't know a gunnist <laughs> i'm not a gunnist yeah yes. exactly so back to uh jonathan grave so um kind of talk about the progression that he's taken in these uh you're 13 you're 14 is getting ready to come out and mm -hmm. then you're working on 15 um but do you do one a year with him yeah yeah every summer every summer you drop one mm -hmm. right. so uh talk about the progression of the character from the first to where he is now? Well, to be honest with you, Jonathan doesn't progress a lot. Jonathan is the, the stories are as much about the person or the people, the couple, the family, it's been all over the board that he's rescuing as it is about he and his team. Yeah. So they are the planners and executors of, of the rescues. Um, he's got this big lethal friend called boxers who I think he's my alter ego, you know, if I were, if I were six eleven and, and, <laughs> and lethal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Jonathan and his team are, are very focused on, on each of the missions and playing with the cool toys and, you know, all of that. That's, uh, that's why I've missed the shot show these last couple of years, because that, that's where all the cool toys come from, the ideas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's, the people who are in harm's way that is is really where they have a complete story arc in in every book. Jonathan really doesn't progress all that much as a character. He he falls in and out of love with one of his co-workers, Gail Bonneville. Uh, love is too strong a word because I'm not sure Jonathan knows what that is, but 
Um, we know that in the first book called No Mercy, he, he lost his, uh, okay, I'll give it away. Um, he lost his wife to, to bad guys. Uh, who then paid the catalyst that got him sparked on his, his mission, his path? Well, he's a, he's a former Delta operator. And okay. so, so he's been a, a door kicker for a long time and he separated early after 17 years, he separated from the army almost to, to retirement. Uh, for reasons that I know, but I've never had an opportunity to put it into a book. So at, at some point, it'll it's become coming. clear why why yeah. he did that. Nice. So it's just what he does, and he's very wealthy. His dad was a career criminal and uh, is serving a, a life sentence, but left him with more money than he knows how to spend. So he sold his childhood mansion to St. Catherine's Church for a dollar on the condition that the mansion be turned into a place called Resurrection House, which is the residential school for the children of incarcerated parents. And wow. Jonathan supports that out of his own parent, out of his own pocket, which by the way, I think that would be a really cool school <laughs> to have, you know, oh, children of incar incarcerated parents. Is that, does one of those not e exist? Not to my knowledge. I mean, if, if it exists, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, Something you could start. Well, I, I after, after one of those movies is made, maybe. <laughs> John Gilstrap Foundation. There yeah. we go. That would be awesome. I'd be behind it, definitely. Um, oh, it definitely sounds like a, an interesting character and different from from other characters, from other uh, authors that I've read, you know, where I had Stephen Hunter on um, a few episodes ago. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about his character, the, the Bob Lee Swagger character. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, in those, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's, he, he's, he gets older. You know, right. So it's kind of a progression, you know, kind of one after the other kind of thing. So I think he's in his like 60s or 70s now in this in his latest um, novel. But, you know, eventually he's going to have to you know, move on. And <laughs> well, Steve Hunter has also done a series of books on Earl Swagger, I think, Bob Lee's father. Well, yeah. And that, yeah. So he's kind of going back uh, into yeah. into history to. To do some stories on that. Yeah. yeah, Steve. Steve Hunter is important to me. I should say this only. He was the first guy when I, when I had written Nathan's Run back in the '90s. He had just come out with, um, oh, Point of Impact. Yeah, Point, Point of, of Impact. Yeah. And uh, he was working for the Baltimore Sun. I was living in Woodbridge, Virginia. That that matters. And. So I had this pile of pages, a manuscript that I I thought was pretty good, and I knew that he worked at the Sun, and I knew so I called him, and he, you know he answers his phone at work, and so we talked. It said, "I I know you're a published author, right? I love your books. What should I do?" And he said, "I think the first words he said to me is, please don't ask me to read your manuscript." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "No, I promise I won't. I won't." So so he gave me some pointers on on what the next steps would be. And then fast forward, I don't know, six months or so when I sold the, the book, I called him back and I said, remember me, you, you talked about it? He said, yeah. I said, well, I sold the book. And he laughed and he said, you know, that's never happened. I've had these conversations many times, but that's never happened. So Steve and I have remained close over, over the years. Um, haven't talked to him, well, COVID, right? So two, two and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. He was a, he was an interesting cat. I enjoyed having him on. He's a big personality. He is. He definitely is. And, and again, he's a pro 2A um, yes, he is. Character and, as well. and he's really good. I mean, he's he's an outstanding shot. Is he? So he yeah. he, he can actually shoot pretty good. Mm -hmm. He's being a little modest uh, during the during our interview with him. So, but we're going to talk about your uh, affinity with firearms as well. But we want to I, I want to learn more about your your character. So I, I'm definitely intrigued with uh, the Jonathan Grave uh, character. So I've got to uh, start reading those. But you've got another one that you started, and what are you two or three into this this series with the the uh, Ver Victoria Emerson? Yeah, Victoria Emerson, Blue Fire. I happen to have actually this isn't even the book. I, I'm in the process of moving, um, yeah. so all of the actual books are in a box someplace. Uh, but this is what's called an advanced reader's copy. But that's that's what the thing that's what the book looks like. Yeah. Um, Victoria Emerson. It, it is post apocalyptic. The the premise of the book, it, it, Blue Fire is a second. Crimson Phoenix came out last year, and that's that's the first. There mm -hmm. again, they're kind of. This is a continuing story, um, but it succeeds as a standalone. If you don't want to start at, at the first, uh, 
But in Crimson Phoenix, the the the, the start of all of this is that um, Israel is planning a nuclear strike against Iran's nuclear launch facility. That's, they just had enough. It's, it's, they've had enough yeah. because you know is, uh, it, Iran keeps making all the the ugly noises that they're going to launch, so they decided to do this this preemptive strike, and. Because the United States has to be involved, you know, we're not doing the shooting, but we're certainly involved. Ukraine. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> Israel and Iran. <laughs> it, it just happens to resonate right now. Yeah. And so they activate the the um, uh, the pro program is called Crimson Phoenix, which is the evacuation of the government to a bunker uh, in West Virginia which is based on the real bunker that existed until the Washington Post broke the story in 1994, yeah. 95. Uh, everybody. Yeah, the US government relocation facility is what it's officially called. And in this book, it's called that, but it's also called the annex. So Victoria is evacuated. I mean, she's taken by uh, army major and, a, and first sergeant uh, to, I mean, you can, we'll carry you or you can walk, but you're leaving now. Right? right, so they spirit her off to this bunker, and she brings her kids because she's a single mom. And when she gets to the bunker, she learns she can't bring the kids in, uh, which is also true from the old plan. Uh, you could the, the the member of the House of the Senate could bring one staff member, but no family. Hmm. So she says, "Screw this," and decides that you know. If, Nobody thinks it's going to actually be a hot war because it's going to be a quick strike. And in the moments before, the president's going to call various powers and say, hey, don't panic. But a blogger um, leaks the story, gets a hold of it, and kind Jack of connects wagon. the ducks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Jack wagon. <laughs> and the story leaks, and Iran launches, excuse me. Yeah, Iran launches first. And then that just starts the, the big exchange. So when it's all done, it's, there's, there's nothing left. And world war, world war. It lasts about eight hours and is done. And um, because it is Wait. nuclear. Oh, OK. So eight hours. That's... Well, you know, we got subs parked off the flight time of ballistic missiles. Now, submarine launched missiles from launch to impact pretty much anywhere in the United States is eight minutes. And the. The target packages, assuming that this hasn't changed since. I've been, I don't think there's anything secret in this. The target packages are all of the launch facilities of the other team's sure. countries. Yeah. So in order, once once the, the Russians launch in this case, because they're protecting themselves, once they launch, we have to launch because if we don't launch, the launch facility, our launch facilities will be destroyed and we won't have that opportunity. Right. So all this, all this happened. It doesn't take long until oh, everything's sure. broken. And it's not going to take long for us to kill ourselves. Right. But, you know, under the, in the fictional world I've created, yeah. uh, while billions of people are killed, uh, we think, because it's all from Victoria's limited point of view, we don't know what she doesn't, if, if she doesn't know it, we don't know it. Yeah. Um, She's in a bunker. Yeah. Well, no, she doesn't. She walks away. She said, oh, you know, whatever. Care. But no, she doesn't go in. Whatever happens, she said, you know, I'll do I'm going to be with my kids. I, I quit. I'm, I'm not a member of the house anymore. And she walks away and she ends up surviving the attacks. Um, and it, it, the, the books are about rebuilding society where people are feral. You know, it doesn't take long. Look how people were shooting each other over toilet paper. Oh my God! A couple yeah. of years ago, imagine if it's baby oh, formula or diabetes medication. Look right? at what's coming though, with with the price of everything going up right now. Gas is what well, five bucks a gallon now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's four bucks here, and I know we're like the cheapest anywhere in the in the country usually. So it's got to be like five, six bucks in California and places like that right now. I just think it's a shame that North America doesn't have any oil resources that we could tap into to uh, if only to save this. Yeah, if only we had. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that's right. We have to turn the spigot back on. That's yeah. It. OK, OK. Wait, we were doing that. Oh, OK. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, we'll get your, your thoughts on that maybe here in a little bit, because we try to keep politics out of the show. We try mm -hmm. to keep it fun, but 
sometimes it rears its ugly head and we need to we need to talk about it from time to time um but i'm really digging uh the premises of your books here so the um, the jonathan grave you know kind of a uh, the the former special forces kind of guy that's on a mission to to right wrong and then victoria emerson the post apocalyptic rebuilding surviving kind of a prepper, prepper right kind, and kind of well prepper. it's in the research that i've done and I, I i i don't think the word prepper is often used i don't think you did it this way but prepper is often used as a pejorative you know we sure. we, we think ill of of preppers and i, I and i kind of am one and i get that a lot on this show too and i try to to use it in the the proper context so that people so it won't go away you know how 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 people turn words into things that they aren't really meant to be right you know one person will use it wrong and then it, it goes viral you know and then now you can't use that word anymore so right. i'm with you on on your mentality just like you post apocalyptic you know mm -hmm. you kinda, people get a different image of that that don't really know what it means so but what i get into in these books <clears throat> the 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 prepper community and the prepper mindset mm -hmm. is just that it's about preparation so that my family is protected. I've got, I've got, depending on how deep into the rabbit hole you want to go, you know, you, you have supplies to last however long you need to supply to last. Uh, but what I get into is the next step because sooner or later society, we're social animals and sooner or later society has to start putting itself back together again. And, you know, if you have, on day one is the attack, you got 12, 13 year old kids come day 30, they're not gonna fit into their clothes anymore, right? So now what do you do? How do you, when people get together, there's no electricity, which means for most communities, there's no running water. Um, there's there's no technology because of the electromagnetic pulse. Communications down, yeah. yeah. And in the bunker, the presidential bunker, the, the, the congressional bunker, they've got all the best communications in the world, but who's going to hear them? Right? I mean, there's nobody else every, has. Yeah. Everything's fried. So this is where the, the Victoria books really deal with not only protecting the community and, and protecting what they have, but also you have to integrate in new people as they come in. You got a lot of suffering folks who don't have anything who need something. And Victoria is is sort of the unelected, unofficial. She's the outsider that people happen to trust. You know, she's that natural leader. And um, you go to work, you know, you arrive and and you get sustenance for a week. And then there's a mechanism that where they can earn money, which is actually ammunition in, in the books, with which they can buy stuff to keep them warm or to feed themselves or, or whatever. So it's kind of a uh, it's it's about rebuilding society while a lot of bad guys are trying to take stuff and hurt people. Yeah. I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> so it reminds me of something else that's been on TV for a while. Uh, it, it, the fact that you took a female character being a male writer. What was what was your thinking in doing that? It, it wasn't a. a it was the character that appeared in my head. It wasn't yeah. an engineered decision. I knew that for the story to work, there had to be a reason for the character, male or female, not to go in. And being a, a single mom, uh, it just it it made sense to me. Yeah, you know, it, it's I get that question a lot, but it's well, I'm, I, not, I, I'm not the kind of writer who plans guy. out a lot of that kind of stuff. It's just that's yeah. the, the character that appeared and. Well, the reason I ask is I was having a conversation with uh, someone uh, just a few days ago, and you know we were talking about all these, um, you know, the Tom Clancy characters, the uh, Brad Thor characters, the uh, Jack Carr characters, the uh, Kyle Mills. Uh, you know, they're all they're all male, strong, former, you know, military. Uh, go get it kind of kind of deals. And I was like, you know, I haven't really seen anybody do a female character, you know, and I don't know if that's something I'm missing or I want to want to see, but 
I guarantee you there's a market for it. You know, I guarantee you there's somebody, and especially the female readers. And I think you're, you know, with this Victoria Emerson, you're kind of, you're kind of doing that. Well, I hope so. And I, and I hope, obviously, Start, I, so. I hope to attract um, uh, all kinds of new readers. Yeah, uh, exactly. What's really interesting, and, and actually we're sort of, um, the, the next book in that series is called White Smoke, that I'm also writing right now. Um, and I see it as a trilogy. I sold the, my, my publisher bought this as, as a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And there may be more, but a lot will depend on whether or not addressing your very question or your very point. We, I don't have any data to show me, do, do the Jonathan Grave fans follow to Victoria Emerson or vice versa? Or is it just like two, like the, obviously there's gonna be a Venn diagram of, of intersection, but we, I have no idea how big that intersecting uh, yeah. oval is. Yeah, I don't know how you attract that either. Well, it'll show up in sales and the, the oh. marketing department will do surveys and such. Yeah, and who's your publisher? Kensington Books out of New York. Kensington, okay. Right. They are the largest in, independently owned, privately, I don't know what the right thing, um, publisher, in, certainly in the United States. Privately held. Yeah, and uh, it's family owned. Market and, kind of deal. No, and they, they, they love books and they've been very, very good to me. There you go, good. Now, other than these two, so you've written other books uh, as well. Talk about the other, other books that you've written. You've written uh, a nonfiction as well. I did, I wrote a book called Six Minutes to Freedom, um, which is about the rescue of Kurt Muse. In fact, you can, you can see right here, the bottom of the commemorative photograph or a painting that was done. Can you move your camera up? Let's see, can I do that? Oh. There you go. Yeah. Right. So in, during the, um, the final days of the Noriega regime, uh, a fellow named Kurt Muse, an American citizen raised on the Panamanian economy. His dad owned a business in, in Panama City. And when he was in his 30s, and Noriega was rising to power, killing a lot of Kurt's friends in the process. Kurt and a bunch of his Rotarian buddies, the Panama City Rotary Club, got together with Radio Shack equipment, not literally, but the over-the-counter type uh, radio equipment, and they were able to override uh, Panama's main uh, broadcasting beam, the, the repeater beam. Yeah. And they broadcast a throw the bum out kind of message. And uh, they got a little carried away. They were not, this was just citizens doing their thing, saying, you know, exercise your right to vote and don't let them beat you up that way, you know, whatever the, the message was. So Kurt and his group became public enemy number one, and he was ultimately betrayed and arrested and was sent to Modelo Prison, which is a god-awful place. And um, while he was there, he found a way to communicate to the military, because you had the Panama Canal Zone, you have all that stuff that's going on. Uh, so anyway, Kurt ended up being rescued by Delta Force in the opening moments of uh, Operation Just Cause. And the uh, literally, the first shots that were fired were in support of his rescue. And um, there, I mean, it's it a great story. And meanwhile, yeah. his, his, his kids, uh, Kimberly, I think, was 15 and Eric was 12. They had to evacuate because when dad was arrested, he was arrested at the airport and the word went out to the kids that they have to run because the PDF, Panamanian Defense Force, was gonna come and get them. So they fled the country by themselves, two kids. And uh, and then ultimately, you know, it's, it's so it was a really fun, it was a fun book to write and involved a lot of research. Yeah, has there been and, any kind of documentary or movie Done about that? There have been a number of documentaries about Operation Acid Gambit, which was the actual rescue of Kurt from Modelo. Yeah. But this is the only uh, book that is, has talked about the uh, the whole story. And it is, I I think it's still in development somewhere as, as a film uh, that's been under option for, God, it's like an annuity. It's been under option for <laughs> 10, 12 years, 16 years. It's been under option for 16 years. Now, do so, they pay you to keep it that way? Yeah, long? yeah, 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 yeah. So, so each year they up, they re, they well, every it. every three years. It's every a, three years they up, redo it. Yeah, yeah. So, so keep thinking about it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> keep <laughs> thinking about it. What so, was the name of that book? 
That was called Six Minutes to Freedom. Okay, it's this one right here. So I've got my screen yep. up now. Oh, I see it. Yeah, Six Minutes to Freedom. Um, yeah, that that's a good one too. And you've got audio. You do audio books as well. All of the I don't think that one is an audio, but all of the others are. All of the all the novels are in audio. Do you and have the e-book. same person that that does all your audio work, or do you have different people do the? I guess with uh, of course with Victoria, you would want a female to do that one. Right, and the and both of those have been. How do I put the? I, I don't. I don't listen to my books. I, I'm so tired of a book by the time I'm done with it. You know, the <laughs> yeah. thought of, of so listening to, to it. Podcast, yeah. yeah. But the um, all of the grave books are narrated by Basil Sands, who's uh, he's a good friend of mine. I had n- nothing to do. I met him be- after he had been hired, and um, and I have nothing to do with those selections. And the lady who reads the the Jonathan books, I know it's I know it's the same reader. But unfortunately, I, I I don't know the name. Oh. That sounds terrible. I don't mean to. No, and that and that's fine. It just it depends on the reader on whether I can get into an audible book or not. Mm-hmm. Who who's actually reading it? And there's been some that I just audible wise I couldn't do it, but I read it and you know it was, it was a lot better for me to read. And I just don't. I hate. You know how you you do voices in your head when you're reading. Mm-hmm. I just don't like my voices. <laughs> I don't think I do good voices, so I'd rather somebody else read it uh, to me. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to check out your books. That's and I'm seeing other ones here too. There's you've done a whole slew of. of there were four. Uh, Scott Free was God. When did I write that? Ninety nine. Two thousand three. Two thousand three. Okay. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, that's a, about a, a young man who survives a plane crash in uh, in the mountains of Utah, I believe, somewhere out in the Rockies, and. Uh, he makes his way through horrible Metallica conditions concert. to a Metallica, right? And and uh, he my ends son up works uh, tours with Metallica. You did? My no, my son. Oh, tours, okay. Yeah, he tours with Metallica. So, but Scott ends up hooking up with with a guy in a cabin who's a uh, uh, murderer, uh, oh. an assassin. So that's that, a, uh, a good book too. I think so. <laughs> it, it, it's funny. That was the book when, as I was writing it, I thought this is so going to be a movie, you know, just because it's visual and all the stuff that was in it. Crickets. I mean, not, not a sniff. Nobody cared. So, uh, William Goldman, the great screenwriter, his, his, his big quote is in the entertainment business, no one knows anything. And I think that's probably true. To listen to how some, some of these movies and TV shows you know, come to be, you would think, yeah, nobody is like, they just all bumbling idiots and it just comes together, you know, miraculously. So it's amazing to me. I have no idea how the Hollywood will works. I don't think think they do. (laughs) It's, it's, it's a business model that couldn't possibly exist anywhere else. Yeah. I, I just don't think there's no model to it. Very good. So you've got coming out, you've got the Victoria Emerson and you've got, did you say you've got a new Jonathan Grave coming? Uh, yeah. The next Jonathan is called um, uh, Lethal Game. That comes out in late June, the last Tuesday in June. Okay. Is that like every book? It comes out the last Tuesday of every June. Is that where your books just kind of? Yeah. I mean, that, it's, that's where I am. The... So you've got to be very organized in in your writing method to be able well, to you, you, these, you'd, these deadlines you'd think so wouldn't you but no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i i am a i am a face on fire deadline writer you know i know these things are due a year in advance of when they're due and i will still be writing my fingers blind here writing my fingers bloody three weeks before it's due it's just yeah. it's the way it works well, i would say by now though your publicist probably isn't too worried about it you don't get a lot of phone calls and stuff do you no, reminding you and no and what i will do is i'll get the the occasional email from my editor that says uh my schedule's getting busy i have time to do it can you get your book done two weeks early she doesn't send those anymore because that's just are you kidding me no (laughs) (laughs) no absolutely not (laughs) no way wait is there more money involved yeah no (laughs) no Very good. So you've got a website. It's 
John Gilstrap, G I L S T R A P dot com. So for for our listeners, you can go to his website. Uh, there's an about him. There's a homepage. There's a list of all his books that he's got there. Can they order order them from here? I think there's links. Of there, right there, yeah, there are links that will take you to a buy. I don't sell from the site because it's just a pain to do that. Yeah. Taxes and oh, stuff. So yeah, let somebody else deal with that. Um, but yeah, so you guys can go there. Uh, essays. What's what's the essays all about? People want to have uh, peeks behind the scenes of what the life of a writer is like. And oh, you got it up there. Uh, you know, the first one up there is a time to quit the day job and write full time. So if you go in there, you find out about taxes and what. How, if if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year writing, you probably clear far less than forty. Oh, geez. By the time it's all done. And, you know, if, if that's if that's enough for you, that's enough for you. If it's not, then you might want to continue with the, the day job. So do they tax writers different than anybody else? What's Well, no, but it goes in. Now we're getting into the weeds of things. It depends on how you're structured. For example, for a lot of reasons, um, most of which don't apply anymore. But when I was first starting, having a corporation, John Gilstrap Incorporated wrote the books. I was the president and I, I was paid a salary. Mm -hmm. Well, because I'm an employee, I have to pay both sides of FICA, which is I. So, you know, the 7% that everybody has to pay, but I had to pay the employer side too. So, you know, all of a sudden that's a, that's yeah, a you get extra, double extra tax burden. Me. Right. So, so why would you just go in 1099? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's still got a 1099 somebody. So, yeah. um, so it just goes into those considerations. Publisher 1099 you. I don't know. I'm not a tax. Don't don't take my yeah. advice. Well, certainly. It's it's actually a complicated model there too because you get the agents, the agency that represents me gets involved. Um, yeah. So these are the uh, I have a it's YouTube not, channel too that goes into a lot of these individual things like what Oh, okay. How yeah. does a movie deal work? You know, what's the What's uh, your YouTube channel? Uh author John Gilstrap, I think. Let Actually, there was a, there was a link there on my website. Oh, there's a link on your website. Yeah. Let me go back to that right here. Yeah. OK, yeah. So he's on YouTube as well. And do you just put these. The writing uh, tips and tricks. Yeah, you can there. scroll through. I think there's 32 of them. I haven't done one in, in too long. Um, so if any of our listeners are aspiring writers, which you know, I've thought about it. I'll I'll get these ideas and say, you know what, this would make a great something that maybe somebody else would be interested in. And then I'll, you know, I'll just get the premise, but then it doesn't go any further than that. Do you do you do you talk about how to take an idea and turn it into a full blown? Not so much. I, this is okay. less on on the details of craft. I teach seminar. We used to teach, you know, COVID. Um, yeah. I teach seminars on on those things, but. Um, okay. Yeah. So any of our listeners interested in being a writer or you are a writer, uh, it looks like he's got a nice series here on YouTube that will give you some very useful tips. Pitching your book, uh, joining a critique group. Is that a good idea? Time to quit the J job, like you said before. Plowing through what's muddled muddle? Muddled muddle. Middle. The muddled middle is when you get you have the great premise and it was great to write it and you know it's going to have this really terrific ending and all you have to write is the middle two hundred pages. Okay, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's kind of me. It's like I got this great idea. Yep, yep. But I don't know how to fill between here and the end. And kind of. the you know the spoiler to that is keep writing. You know, just work it out. There's no there's no right or wrong in these things. I'm going to write that down and go back and watch that one. Plowing through the muddled middle. That's got my name on it. Let me go back and watch that one. So yeah, that's an interesting thing. So on uh, YouTube, so you don't go about, you don't talk about any of your books or anything on your YouTube channel. You don't no. know. Well, there's there's the initial credit roll kind of thing, but that's five seconds. I got you. I got you. Uh, and then movies. Uh, Gilstrap hired to adapt true story of heroism. So have you have you been involved with some movies? You done some movies? Well, 
movie project, nothing that has ever been on the screen, but um, seven screenplays, screen projects. Okay. And I'm working on an eighth right now. Is that for movies or uh, TV shows? You know, that's a not that's not really a decision I make. You know, if if there's interest, <clears throat> excuse me, in the script that I'm writing, I'm writing with. How are they? Take it to the medium is how they take. Yeah, it. I, I send it to my agent, and the agent sends it out, and whoever sniffs the bait is um, is where it goes. Yeah, these days, you know, if it's not a superhero uh, or an art house uh, movie, it, it, the features are just not the way to go. Yeah, uh, it's and this limited series stuff. I I, I am completely hooked on Netflix, and yeah. and Amazon Prime has a number of them too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I am too. There's one that just came out, um, Reacher. Uh, oh, Reacher's great. I, I like that. Uh, di completely different than the movie character. Yes. Other Much than they, buy, they both get their clothes from <laughs> Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, but yeah, do you know that author? I can't, who's the I do, author? Lee Child is, is his name. And, and now it's okay. Andrew Child is writing for his brother Lee. Um, but Lee's a great guy really yeah very giving um to, i just haven't to read, read one of those series but i've just seen the the netflix and the movies and you no know, they're enjoyable mm -hmm. yeah i mean he, he kicks ass yeah. and and he's jack reacher is smart and he's lethal yeah and he's huge he's like that 611 guy that you're yeah <laughs> it's yeah exactly in your book uh big big dude uh, I thought I read somewhere or saw or heard something that you were involved with with some writing on some TV show or or movie that you did. I guess I misheard. No, I I, I worked. Um, see, I did two movies or two scripts, not two movies. I did two scripts for Dino De Laurentiis, uh, nominally, I guess, for Universal. Um, yeah. But then I did a project with um, uh, on the Warner lot. Oh, God, mm -hmm. what's Barry Levinson's company? Uh, anyway, um, that, was called, that, that was called Young Men in Fire, uh, which was a, it was a fun project to work on, and it, it went nuts. I, I, I'll never work in that town again if I tell the entire story, but it, it's, <laughs> well, don't, don't. It, 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 it went crazy. It was a very Hollywood kind of experience. Yeah. And I guess you've had a lot of experience with it, with all the, you know, the options and then coming after, uh, after you for some of your, your books for movies. So, uh, it just sounds like it's very fickle. <laughs> well, just... it's capricious. This whole business of, of, you know, I, I, I make stuff up and people buy it. And there are a lot of other people who make stuff up and people don't buy it. And, I don't know what the X factor. I like to think that there's an element of talent that counts, but there are a lot of talented people that that don't have success either. And in the movie business, there are just so many moving parts and so many uh, people. You know, it's yeah. not just the writer. Then you get the director and the producer, and and then the uh -huh. actors, and then the. It, I don't know. My uh, my girlfriend is in the movie business, movie TV business. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I hear a lot about the inside stuff from her. So, yeah. But just, somehow it works. You know, somehow the, the, the projects works. come out the other end. Yeah, it works because they let people push them around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There, there's those those people up top that know how to pull people's strings. I, I don't get it. I want to do this now. I want to go to some of our listener questions because uh, I've been holding back on some of my questions because I, I think some of them are covered on this. So I'm going to go to Instagram. I'm going to pull it up on my phone here and I'll go to Facebook too. I don't know if anybody posted on Facebook. Uh, so we're going to go to Instagram first and it's coming up and even Instagram shadow bands is also real, real heavy. And we've got some questions here. All right. And you'll have to forgive me. I got to put my glasses on. Don't know what I did with them. Here they are. I'm getting to that where I can't see up close stage. I can see Get far away really good. 
This is from uh, Brian Keeney. And Brian is a uh, a huge action thriller novel lover. Uh, he's been on the show a couple of times and co-hosted with me um, with Jack Carr and Stephen Hunter. and uh, Oh, wow. I think Kyle, Kyle Mills. I don't know if he was on that one with me or not, but um says, I'm assuming by your subject matter that you're a prepper. How have your preps changed between 2019 and today? Um, 2019 and today, I have gone from uh, a suburban environment uh, in northern Virginia. And on Friday, I'm moving to six acres out in the woods in West Virginia <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, the freezer is going to be a lot bigger and um, it, a, it's a bunker. <laughs> well, kind of actually. Um, but it, it's the philosophy hasn't changed at all, but I, the, the volume, the physical space has changed because I, I think that um, and, and actually, you know, food preservation is, is, getting better and I, i'm not a big believer in the stocking you know, mres and all yeah. that because all that has a shelf life and it just you know takes up space but you know a lot of a lot of bambi and um assorted are you a hunter um i i am just beginning into that i went on a a, a pig hunt back in uh october i shot a pig one shot one kill 275 yards very nice. Yeah, it's I uh, off, that, isn't it? <laughs> that, that I that I put the gun away and said, okay, that's it. No, it's um, I, en I enjoy the Texas? process. Texas, Paris, Texas. Paris, Texas. Very nice. Yeah, I've done a lot of hog hunting down in down Texas. It's fun. What uh, what rifle did you use? What caliber? I had a Browning X Bolt 308. 308. You did it suppressed? No. 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 I kind of like the bang, to be honest with you. It's yeah. it's a uh, it wasn't, we weren't hunting at night. Um, okay. So you weren't using thermals or anything like that? Just, no, no, you don't have to. God, they, no, you don't have to. No, it's like shooting. It's just sports. fun. It is it's fun to it go is. And use the thermal and the suppressor. It's, I've seen the YouTube videos of the guys in the, in the ATVs, you know, chasing them down and, and shooting them from helicopters and such. That, that looks, that looks like it could be a lot of fun. But yeah. this was sitting in a, in a deer blind the yeah. day before, it was the end of October. It was two days before deer season started. And you'd sit there, and I bet we saw 35 deer just wandering <laughs> around. You know, and they give you the finger. They do all kinds of oh, things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the last time I went, it was up in uh, northwest Texas. And uh, it wasn't deer season. And that's all. I, I probably saw 300 deer. I kid you yeah. not. I'm not exaggerating. During that, during that week. And couldn't touch a one of them. And there were some nice ones, too. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, ooh, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and eat it now, you know. <laughs> so, but the getting back to his question, the I've I have shifted gears from the theoretical to the practical. Um, the new house is going to have a, a real garden, and I've I've never, and I've grown things in window boxes, and you do the tomato plant in the backyard and that kind of stuff. But I want to actually really grow stuff. We're going to have bees. Um, yeah. It, it's and really kind of not so much because I expect Armageddon to come, but because I think it's kind of a cool thing to do, and why not? You want to be more self reliant, self mm -hmm. kind of kind of deal, self sustaining. Plus, I'm a long yeah. way from a grocery store and a garden. You know, that's that's a good way to do that. Now, have you been studying up on your gardening, or I or have, in fact, growing a garden. I can't reach it. It's over there. Yeah, I've subscribed to magazines. I'm reading it. There's a lot of um, master class is a thing. It's a it's a video program that the um, they have oh, a lot of good hey. stuff on gardening. Yeah, I, I heard that. Yeah. Um, so the the gardening, the bees. What made made you think of getting into the the bees? Because that's that takes some time. That takes some work. Well, again, it's the. The area where I live is there are a lot of um, what is it, apiaries, I think is what they're called, um, bee places. Yeah. And, you know, I th I'm a big, a big supporter of bees. I, I think <laughs> Love honey. The, 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 the bee population has had some real problems. And yeah. apparently my little slice of West Virginia, um, 
supports, you know, it supports that. Yeah. Plus I get a tax break. Okay. Let's be honest. There's, there's that. Oh, well, bees, there's... bees are considered livestock in West Virginia. So. Okay. Um, so you're gonna have a bee farm. That's cool. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I, 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 after it, I get stung it, five or six times, maybe I will change I was going to say, mind plus it could this. be a good defensive. Uh, oh, there you go. Put in place, you know, kind of a, a, a barrier. So next question. Um, this kind of goes along with the the same question. What drew you to the post-apocalyptic writing? My favorite movie book topic, by the way. That's uh, AKM Archer asked that. Well, as a child of the 70s, um, I read Alas Babylon, On the Beach, Failsafe, you know, all of that, the Cold War era apocaly apocalyptic stuff. Yeah. Um, I was always drawn to that. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I was, never drawn to the monster stuff. It just, I never, I never bought it. You know, the vampires movie. and stuff like that. No, no. And there were, it, there was also that whole, the creature from the black lagoon. I think that was a lizard that got exposed to radiation or whatever, whatever. Any of it, I was yeah. never drawn to that. Um, in this case, in this specific series, I was visiting the Greenbrier uh, resort or hotel and conference center, whatever it's called in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, which is where the real, government relocation center was and you can take a tour of the place <clears throat> and you know i started talking to these folks and it just occurred to me that that the government well for, there's a number of things that went through my mind all at once um the government protects itself in a in a blast proof bunker with all this food and electricity and uh medical facilities and all of this while their constituents are getting fried and and breathing radioactive crap and there's there's something about that that rubbed me wrong and then when i found out that the expectation was that the members of the house and the senate and presumably the executive branch too i don't i don't know that um they say goodbye to their to their families and allow them to become dust while you do this really important thing that in my imagination is useless because there's nothing for them to do. Congress allocates money to rebuild. Okay, what does money mean to anybody? You know, yeah. it's fuel, it's green pieces of paper, but it, it doesn't have any practical value. And who's gonna do the rebuilding? Who are you, what, who's going to, who are you gonna contract with? And I think I mentioned before, with all the best communications equipment in the world, nobody can hear what you're saying. I mean, certainly the, the, the people you represent can't hear it. So I just thought this was the, the, a great idea for a world in which to to tell a story. Very good. Let's see. I'm going to implement these into it, but I know we're running uh, on time here. I don't want to keep you all day, but uh, I do this series of questions when I have a new person on the show. Okay. And we call it the new questions. <laughs> uh, so we kind of know a little bit about your your background. Uh, not it's not law enforcement or military, but you do have a first responder uh, mm -hmm. background, uh, and we talked a little bit about that. But um, talk about how you got involved with the fire department and the EMT. I was working at a summer camp for overprivileged rich kids uh, when through college. That was my summer job. And on my last day of my last year, a uh, little kid in, under my control, um, who was supposed to be, ran out in the middle of the road and got hit by a car. And he, he, and he got nailed. Um, broken legs, fractured pelvis, ruptured bladder. You know, he, I mean, he was really, really screwed up. And, he, and he's okay now. That was quite a few years ago, and he's okay now. Um, but it was a long recovery. And I was the first one. I mean, you hear this noise. And I and I saw him and I was the first one on the scene. I had no idea what to do. He was so pale and he was so, uh, and I, I was I was scared and I was upset and I was and I and I when that was over, I enrolled in an EMT class because I was never going to be unprepared again. And that led to ride alongs and um, hospital uh, hospital time, you know, you, the rotations to to get your your yeah. certificate. And from there, I started with the fire department 
and ran exclusively ambulance for a couple of years and then ran my first house fire and I fell in love with that part of it too. So stuck with it for about 15 years, rose to the rank of lieutenant. And um, it was, it, that's, that's how I did it. I ended up stopping when I fell through a floor in a fire, um, found the seat of the fire, <laughs> but um, didn't get hurt. I should have been killed, didn't get hurt. You fall like a considerable amount of no, I fell to my armpits. The, it was a it was a daycare center at night. There was nobody there, but it was an old house that had been converted to a daycare center. Oh. A lot of smoke, a lot of heat, but we couldn't find the fire. And um, I I was stupid, and I I left the wall to try to find the the, the you don't throw water at smoke. You have to throw water at at the fire. And I so I went to find the fire, and I got to the middle of the room, and the floor went away, and I got my arms out and caught myself that way so i was you know, like dangling classic yeah and i think movie falling through the, the floor but but here's the thing we kept our radios in a pocket yeah over here so <laughs> <laughs> there's no way for me to get to it but if you, if you scream loud enough people will come and pull your ass out of the hole your tongue was long enough come on yeah <laughs> well you're wearing a mask it would be other no otherwise but i take it they you got rescued they came and yeah, you and then went down to the basement. We put the fire out, and I just got to thinking, you know, it's, it's volunteer. I'm getting older, and um, they have responsibilities. And was that and, the deciding factor to to hang up the? The deciding factor was not that so much as I realized that that changed my my viewpoint. I I started I started thinking about the wrong things, and um, tempering you know, as as a young man. Yay! You know, you see the fire and you just rush in and and yeah. you know if you get burned, that's okay. You got something cool to talk about, and um, and I just realized that I was I shouldn't be doing this anymore. I, I wasn't as I wasn't as focused on the mission as as I was before. I think I, it it got into my head that I had too much to lose. And at that time, were you were you into the writing? I'd always been in, I've been into writing since always. I've been able to pick up a pen but right then i had finished what was my third unpublished and i never tried to sell those and i had the um and that actually led it it's kind of a bureaucratic boring thing but that led to directly to being appointed to a county commission that exposed me to the juvenile detention center the conditions of the juvenile detention center in the county where i lived and that led to nathan's run and boom so, you know, every wow. it's, it's weird how everything is kind of linked together. Yeah. yeah. Now, the the explosive um, part of your life, was that before the fire MT, EMT or after? Or was that during the whole? You in the, to your, in the middle. Um, I was my, my undergraduate degree is history. And then I ended up getting a graduate degree in safety engineering which I kind of related the fire service. I never wanted to be a, a, a paid firefighter, just didn't want to. Yeah. Um, but to be a safety engineer was kind of cool, especially we were just building the Washington Metro state system and all that at the time. And a guy that I met in class um, was working in an explosives plant, a propulsion plant, and um, looking for then a junior engineer. And he hired me and I did that for eight years, nine years. Now, what does an explosive engineer do? Um, our my job was to make sure stuff didn't blow up until it was supposed to. Um, okay, it's propellant in particular. Man, explosives are made like bread in great big mixers, Hobart mixers. I mean, yeah. they're just they're just huge, um, with really really fine sheer clearances um, and any form of contamination any piece of metal, any rock, any uh, boneheaded move at, at the mix station, yeah. um, it'll, it'll blow up. And so I had my job dealt with, don't let it blow up, but if we assume it does, then how do we keep the, the blast from hurting people? It's okay to lay down trees, but you can't, um, you can't hurt people. I was doing this because I see you've got all your digits. I do. I do. That <laughs> means I'm a, I'm, your a, fingers. I'm a good explosives guy. Right. I don't know about your toes, but he's got all his fingers. So he, 
he did well. He he survived it. Uh, did you get the opportunity to test the explosives? Oh yeah, all the time. And actually, it was also my job to the only legal way to dispose of explosive waste is to burn it. And we had these enormous burn pits out in the. This is a 600 acre facility, so out in the back 40. Um, you, we'd pile thousands of pounds of this stuff into a pit. And, and my job was to push the button. And uh, it was, there's, there's no bad day when you blow stuff up. It, it's, no. just, it's, uh-uh. it's pretty cool. What's, uh, what's one of the coolest things you had the opportunity to explode? Well, I don't know if it was cool or if it was terrifying. I, had, um, I accidentally uh, had a 1,500-pound detonation of, of <laughs> a fine aluminum powder and ammonium perchlorate, which um, we broke windows for miles oh, and, and set the world on fire, which is also my job. I was the head of the, um, in, in charge of the plant fire brigade. Uh, that was, that was exciting. Uh, but I'm not sure it was all that much fun. I laugh about it in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> so Tannerite's nothing to you. <laughs> so, well, Tannerite's pretty cool. And, you know, the guy, I sh- shouldn't make fun of people who got hurt, but you've seen the the lawnmower? The guy stuffs Tannerite into a lawnmower and he shoots oh, it from like 50 feet away. I think it killed him. I know that it hurt him. Oh, shit. Sure. Uh, no, I haven't. The, that's bad stuff. I mean, tan- it's not bad. It's fun stuff. But Tannerite's- I saw one where they had it in a... a um... A car, it's like a wrecked mm-hmm. piece of shit car, and they did it. And you see the door come right by the camera, and the guy's just on the right side of the camera, and it goes just to the left side of the camera. Uh, I've seen that one. You seen the like, one at the the hog feeder? <laughs> yeah, I've seen. <laughs> hey, hey, psst, I've done that. <laughs> Not necessarily like they weren't alive, so we oh, wanted okay. this this hog hunt in Texas, uh, for, uh, wounded vets. We took some wounded vets out and did this hog hunt. And, um, you know, we're not going to eat the the meat or anything like that. So after the, the day's kill, we stack them all together in this big pile underneath, you know, this big thing, a uh, of Tannerite. And then we give the, the vets an opportunity. We go, you know, hundred, 200 yards and to shoot it. You know, just kind of adds to the, the fun of the day. And then it just, we just explain and comes down. And then that night we'll come out and we'll hunt coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a closed system. It's an integrated system. It, right. You know, it's just, it's, it's cyclical. It's kind of, it's kind of thing, but uh, yeah, it's, that's kind of fun. Edit, edit, edit. I'm going to edit all that out. Um, next question from our listeners how heavy is explosive protection gear? This is from Tongue Four Wiston. Or T Wiston. I have never, I've never done the EOD stuff. I'm, I'm not the. the I mean, if it, we're talking about the. Um, what was the movie? The horrible movie. It won the Academy Award. Oh, did you think it was horrible? I did. I did. It, I like. It, it was just. It's just that's not how it works. Um, and I've heard that. I've heard that it's not. Uh, it wasn't realistic at all. And right. a lot of it was just fabricated crap, but I enjoyed the movie. <laughs> so the one EOD guy, so so the basic answer to the question is I don't know. Um, I've yeah. I've never worn it. I've seen it at the SHOT Show and, and stuff, and it, it looks really uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, the one EOD guy I do know who does this for a SWAT team, um, he doesn't wear, he, he wears a, a like ballistic armor with, with plates, but he doesn't wear anything on his arms and hands because he doesn't want to lose the dexterity. And if if it's big enough to blow, it, he's going to lose his arms and hands anyway. So his his mindset is to it, it, it's better to be able to use your have fine movements in your hands than it is to. You know, I, it, this is not a line of work I would ever do. I that's yeah it's, that's what robots are made for in my world. You know I just I can't. Well, and, you know, I think those are becoming more and more the thing too, rather than an actual person going and mm-hmm. I, I, it's killing the hurt locker. I had to look hurt it up. locker. That's it. The hurt <laughs> yeah. locker. Yeah, Jeremy Rainier oh, is in that. All right. Next question is, uh, what's your earliest recollection of shooting a gun? 
firearm. How wordy and what was it? It was a Remington Target Master made in 19... They only made between 1936 and 1939. So it was the, the, oh, wow. the gun my dad got for his 11th birthday, 10th birthday. And we went out shooting this thing. I still have it. It's a, it's a tree trunk and, and a hunk of iron. This thing weighs a ton and it's a single shot bolt action 22. So you okay. open, open the bolt, slide it in, and then you have to pull back the hammer and, and shoot it. Yeah, uh, the, I've got one. It was an indoor range in Annandale, Virginia. I don't think the, the place exists anymore. Um, so I, it's, that's how I learned to aim and shoot. And it's still, there's a lot of surface rust on it now because it wasn't stored all that well, Yeah. but I still take it to the range and you can still drive nails at 50 yards with, with that thing. It's yeah, there you go. I'll get will you take, with this. I'll get you some take it off? You can, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It'll, it'll definitely go in and, and clean it and then it'll protect it too and keep it from getting any more rust. This, talking about the seal one guys. Okay, cool. Yeah, very, very good on uh, preventing rust and corrosion. And I had, <clears throat> I, I just put this thing in storage. I wish I had thought to keep it. Um, the first gun I held, my great grandfather, Isaac Lincoln Gilstrap, was mm -hmm. a deputy U.S. Marshal in Oklahoma Indian Territory and killed in the line of duty in 1906. And um, I have the um uh, the um uh, Colt 45 Bisley that was his personal revolver his service weapon was taken from the body after he, after he was killed but this is the one that he would carry according to family lore but it's got the bakelite grips that are really really well worn and it's notched supposedly for the the guy he killed but the Bisley has a curved hammer that oh, Bisley I'm sorry B I S L E Y I think yes. and I'm going to pull it up while you're talking. Okay. And because of the curved hammer, he would wear it as a as a pocket gun in his back pocket under a great coat. And yeah, that's it. You see lot 148, the one that's marked there. Say so when I get over it. Down. Oh, that there. one. There. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yep. That's what it looks like. So Again, as family lore has it, the um, because of the, the the curved hammer he could carry in his back pocket under a greatcoat, and he was serving a warrant on a guy named Wattenbarger, and Wattenbarger drew down on him, and my grandfather beat him to it and shot him, killed him, and under the trigger guard, just forward, I'm pointing, it doesn't mean anything to you, but right, um, come, go, go straight up, right in there, right on, on, the, on the bottom surface. Mm -hmm. um, he carved a big X and family lore has it. He swore that he would never kill again. I have no idea if any of that story is true, but I, I have that Good story. And it was the, um, it was the first one I held. It was, you did not, you did not touch that gun without dad yeah. there. Um, but it was, so you still have it. You have, Oh, it. I do. I do still have oh, it. Wow. I, I don't have it to show. Unfortunately, I just literally yesterday put it into the new house. Did you um, not know you were doing the talking lead podcast? Well, I, you know, I just Come didn't. It's, I got a lot of moving parts in my life right now. <laughs> um, but it, it's uh, it, it's pretty cool. I've never shot it. It's that's black a nice, powder. Yeah, that's a nice family heirloom. It there. is. Now, do you have children? We haven't just talked about I that. I have one son. He's 35. Okay. Is he into firearms and shooting? And... Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's usually, he becomes my okay. my assistant when I go to the um, the SHOT Show. So we do the the whole media day thing. And, and did you make that. it to this year's shot show? No, I didn't. And in large part he? because he, he broke his leg and uh, we like really badly at, at work. So um, we didn't, this was, this was kind of a shit show year. We all got hit with COVID really bad. My wife went to the hospital with COVID and fully vaxxed by the way. Um, yeah, there you go. Hmm. And hmm, how about that? So no, we, we we couldn't make it this year. And quite honestly, with all the masks and stuff, I'm not wandering around those convention centers wearing them. Yeah. Well, masks. they had, uh, from what I understand, because I didn't go um, this year either, just because I didn't want to deal with all that bull crap. Mm -hmm. um, is that there was a lot of nonconformity. 
So uh, okay, brothers and sisters did well in bucking the system there. But I miss it. That has been two years. Oh, I do too. Yeah, I do too. Now NRA is coming up. Do you go to the NRA? You know, I never have because I always go to the Shot Show. When's NRA? Uh, it is May, like twenty first through the twenty fourth or something like that. Huh. May twenty two. Let's see. It is, and it's in um, it's in Houston, twenty seventh through the 29th, so the end of May. Okay. Yeah. So oh. we're we're planning on going to that. Um, typically, somebody will host us to put the the studio, and we'll do recordings and stuff from mm -hmm. from Shot Show and NRA. So we're looking for a host. Uh, so if anybody's listening and they want to host us for that, uh, an availability just came up. So get in touch with me, talking at gmail dot com. Um, but I probably will go either way just to, just to walk around and, and check it out. I think you, I think you'd enjoy it. It's, um, it's not as big or as hectic as SHOT Show. Mm -hmm. Um, but you still have, and I don't know if there's probably going to be several people that, that don't go to this too company wise that just, that pulled out a SHOT Show, just like uh, they'll probably do here, but. Uh, it's still people bring their newest, latest, and greatest, and sometimes you get stuff that they didn't release at Shot Show at the NRA. Okay. So I'll look into that actually because it's, it's just been too long. I I so enjoy those things, and, and frankly, there's a lot of, um, for me, a lot of research opportunities talking to people. Um, Jeff Gonzalez, I don't even know him or not. Um, he's no. a he's a former um, SEAL. I don't know if a retired SEAL, I guess. And now he's... I've had several SEALs on the show. Um, maybe that's where I heard of him. Maybe one of them mentioned him or something. But he's really, he's been a lot of help to me in um, like night vision technology and such and getting, mm -hmm. getting information that would be really hard to find outside of that level of expertise. And frankly, it's like fish in a barrel. It, it, everybody who's anybody is there. And if you need oh. expertise on anything in what I do... Um, yeah. I have to, I'm supposed to look smart or Jonathan. I, I need to make Jonathan Grave look like he knows what he's doing. And it's, it's well, a that's great kind of one of our questions from our listeners. I saw that. Uh, I think it might have been P Man 301. Uh, how much boots on the ground research do you do in, into one of your, your Jonathan Graves or, or the, uh, the Victoria books? Uh, well, let's do the Jonathan Is Graves. It the sites? Um, well, I, there isn't, Jonathan Grave has never handled a weapon system that I has, have not handled. Now, it could have been at Media Day at the SHOT Show, um, but I've also, I was a bad guy for some FDLE, Florida Department of Law Enforcement SWAT team training. Um, I, was, I was the bad guy, a hostage taker in a school, and we were doing, it was a SIMS training class. So... I, I worked with them as, and they, they taught me a lot of their techniques or I observed a lot of their techniques. And then I asked very specific questions like if the bad guy did this, how would you handle it? And we'd actually act it out. Um, I've right. been to the uh, SEAL compound in Virginia Beach. I've been to HRT headquarters in Quantico. And so I do a lot. What's, what's nice about writing in the genre that I write, the Jonathan Grave stuff, and having done it for a long time, I, I sell, I'll knock wood here probably do hell with a microphone, but um, people will answer, answer my emails and, and I'll get to go and, and play with stuff. So the answer is a lot of, of hands-on research. I understand that you've been to Gunsight in Arizona. I have. Done some training. I've got an opportunity coming up. It was supposed to be in the end of this month, but they changed it to June. So in June, I'm going to be going up there and doing some defensive pistol, rifle, and shotgun training. I did. Any tips? Well, <laughs> um, the road that leads up, unless they fixed it, it is one of the worst roads on the planet that leads up to the last mile or so to Gunsight Academy. It's like driving on a, on a washboard. Um, but apparently they do that on purpose. The locals don't want people speeding. But sure. uh, Gunsight Academy itself is amazing. Uh, I took a, a week-long handgun, carbine, and knife course. Um, edged weapons, yeah. which Steve Tarani uh, taught the the knives, who's 
first of all, he's a really great guy and stupidly good at, at what he does. And that was really interesting. Obviously, we don't fight each other with knives. Um, but we do. We did get to attack pig carcasses that were dressed in various levels of clothing. You know, so we had the winter clothes and the T-shirt and all this. And it's really astonishing how, I guess I always thought stabbing took more effort than it really does. And yeah. in fact, I, I took a, a swipe, you know, against this pig carcass. And I actually thought I whiffed it. I don't know how I could have done that. But I actually had in fact, going through the jacket and the chest cavity into oh, wow. the thoracic cavity with, with one sweat. Yeah. yeah. And so, no, Gunsight Academy is terrific. And Paulden, Arizona, I think is where it's located. I, I forget, you know, you're not, there's no Ritz Carlton there. Um, but, and the people, you know, gun people are, are just fun people to be around, right? Yeah. They, they're sort of, um, it looks like, because it was a, a, a pistol and carbine course, and you're doing a shotgun course as well. The lobby of the hotel looks like it's a departure from <laughs> some, you know, military outfit, right? All the all the gun well, cases. That's the way uh, any of these like events or shows that you go to, like these range day events and and things right. like you go to the hotel and it's just full of gun people and the, all the workers and local are just like looking around, like what the hell? Who are, who are these yahoos? <laughs> Do you ever go to uh, any of those other range days, like a, an Iraq veteran or, a, uh, you know, there's other people that put on range days? Um, no, the, um, first of all, I'm, I'm not an Iraq veteran, so that, that would, but. Um, well, that's not, that's just the name of the YouTube channel. He was a veteran. He's like one of the big YouTube guys, and they put on a range day, and, you know, all the gun companies come out, Glock and Celtic and SIG and. Mm -hmm. You know all those kind of, but it's a smaller, more intimate, you know, kind of thing where it's just media people that come out, like other YouTubers, other oh, okay. podcasters, and you know things. No, like that. I, that sounds like a lot of fun. I I like to score an invitation. One of the coolest things I did. Oh, guy. Okay, I know a guy. All right, let's do it. I know a guy. Um, about four years ago, I guess I went to down to Quantico. The Marine Corps base was the joint captured materiel exploitation command which was a, a demonstration of all the shit that they picked up from battlefields that belonged to other armies and other insurgency groups so you know i shot a pk i shot that I don't know what cool. all they had it was it was very cool that would be um, awesome yeah and uh, but however <clears throat> first time i've ever been to a place that you do pick up every bit of brass that you fire. The last thing that doesn't matter who you are, you're a visiting author, it doesn't matter. You get on your hands and knees with that bucket and you go and you pick up every spent shell casing, which I have no problem with at all. It's yeah. just, I had never seen that before. Unless I'm shooting a minigun, you know, or something like that. And yeah. <laughs> I'll probably <laughs> just say, I'll it's pass. Shovel. <laughs> it's shovel. Magnet. You've seen those big magnets that they have. That, yeah. That range. That's, that's tough with brass, but. Yeah. Well, they got those little, um, those little spiky things that just kind of pick them up. But I've seen them do that. Um, oh, I was going to say, I was going to tell you something. Else. Oh, I went to Poland um, a couple of years ago. Got to go to uh, to Poland to the, um, uh, it's an AK manufacturer there, AK-47 manufacturer. And uh, we got to do tours of these other facilities. Uh, and one was a tank facility where they refurbished old tanks and put new electronics and, you know, furniture and everything like that. And then, you know, I guess they resold them to, to other militaries and, and things like that. But that was, that was really cool. But this one had all this surplus stuff, like you're talking about, they had old night vision, like, you know, 60s, 70s type. Oh my God. Stuff that they Star used. Star scopes and all that. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was amazing, but they had just crates and crates and crates that you could see for, you know, for thousands of yards of all this stuff. It was like, oh, this is amazing. That was a, that was a good time. So that was your earliest the the Beasley. Is that what it's called? Bisley. Bisley. The Bisley. Now has has your character used the Bisley in no. one of your novels yet? No, I think um, single action, six <laughs> shot, uh, big heavy That's piece of iron. That's not really Jonathan's way. It'd be one of those things where it was just an emergency situation, and, and oh, there it was. And now, yeah, I, 
I don't know if you're being serious or joking, but the, you touch on a thing that makes my life difficult uh -huh. in that the the Bisley hasn't been made. Well, that I shouldn't don't want to go too far out of my over my skis. To my knowledge, they stopped making that like early on, like 1908, 1909, something like that. Yeah. And they were black powder. Well, you'll blow it apart if you take modern um, 45 long colt and you shoot it, it'll blow the thing apart. So uh, those that. those are the gun details that sometimes See? are not worth researching to find out. And when in fact I could just have him reach for something else. Yeah. Or a bad guy reaches for that and doesn't know okay. that it puts the bullet in. Uh -huh. Your guy knows it. Jonathan knows that it's going to blow up and he's just standing there like Superman. <laughs> I'm just, I am funning with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so when it comes to pop culture, you know, you're you're a writer. I know you probably don't get into a lot of watching TV and movies and, and stuff like that, but you grew up, you know, you were younger once. Um, what was what was like your go to like TV show or movie or maybe it was a book, you know, books and magazines were big in our day. Uh, you know, you get the you know, you, you said you don't get in, into monsters, but like those Fantasia magazines. You remember those? Mm -hmm. that, that, I do the monsters and things like comic books, you know, comic books were big when I was growing up and I got in big to into comic books, got two older brothers. So I got a lot of hand-me-downs of the comic books, you know, and stuff like that. But, um, what is your go-to where you just sit down, you could relax and you could just watch as, it. as a kid or do it. No, just, just now, what would you do? Maybe it's something that, that you did as a kid. Um, well now it's, it's, sitting down with an adult beverage and watching a good Netflix series is great. Um, I look forward to, again, we're in this transitional thing, we're in the process of moving. So in this apartment, there's no place to sit and read. And I haven't read a book in seven months and it's making me crazy. So in the new place, it's got a library in it. And I look forward to quiet nights of, of just plowing through. And what's uh, that beverage that you got sitting next to you? Um, Oh, over here, this one? Oh, no, over there. Okay. That, um, <laughs> no, just what's your go to beverage? You said, before, like sitting down before, with beverage. before dinner, it's a beef eater martini. And in the evenings, it'll be a wee dram of scotch. Single yeah. malt, Lagavulin is my favorite. Which is interesting. Jonathan Gray's favorite scotch is Lagavulin. I how, think I meant. How is that possible? How is that possible? I've mentioned it, I think, in every book hoping that at some point the Lagavulin people will be grateful and send me a case of it. But so far, that's never no, happened. Nothing. Well, we need to get them on the show. That's right. And say, oh, by the way, I heard about you guys through uh, Mr. Gilstrap's novels. Are you familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that is, a, that is a nice beverage of choice. I like that. Now, is that like your daily routine or nightly routine? Is the beef feeder before and then the... No, well, the, the beef eater before is fairly routine. The the redram afterwards is often the step too far. <laughs> so so you got I got to pace myself on that. That's the deep relaxation when you right when you hit well that. tonight is today is Wednesday. So yes, um, at six o'clock Eastern tonight, I will get together with two writer buddies, and we will have a happy hour, which we've had ever since COVID started on on Wednesday nights. And um, so that'll be personally get together. Or are you guys doing a virtual uh, uh, Zoom? It, Zoom? it used to be, yeah, it used to be personal, but obviously. You guys just toss around some ideas and things that you're working on, or is it just talk personal stuff? You know, you get writers together. The one thing they never talk about is writing. There it you just, go. It doesn't come up um, unless, well, unless they're running late on on their their uh, submission. Or if a copy editor has gone crazy and starts noticing stuff that shouldn't should be noticed. talk smack about other writers. Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yes. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> we're 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 men, right? Of course. That's we're right. <laughs> we have some very strong opinions that will never be aired anywhere outside of that uh, Zoom call. Yeah. Now, were you a Magnum PI fan at all growing up? I I was in college when Magnum PI was was the thing, so I didn't yeah. watch a lot of them. I'm yeah. a huge fan of um, Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods, you know, the, the, the okay. current Tom awesome. Selleck thing. Haven't um, watched an episode of that. 
I but the it. what I recall of Magnum, I remember a Ferrari, um, and you know a lot of door kicking and some weird English guy that never made sense. Higgins, to him. Higgins, Higgins, and Higgins. They lived on this uh, estate in Hawaii that was owned by a famous writer. Oh, Jonathan Masters. Okay, was he's fictional, but right. that's why I was asking. Is like did. Was that maybe something that led to you wanting to become a writer as well? But no, I devoured That answers books. my question. <laughs> I devoured books when I was a kid. I just... Um, I think you would like Magnum P.I. I think, um, And you can watch it. I think it's on Hulu or something. Oh, I see it pop up periodically. I don't... I, haven't, I watch segments of it. It looks yeah. entertaining. It well, there's a new kind of, kind of campy. There's a... Oh, it's definitely... It's definitely... It's 80s, you know, yeah. but... It's really good, and there's a lot of the literary stuff in there because of the guy, Jonathan Masters, but he narrates his own story throughout it. Magnum does. The, mm -hmm. He's a private investigator kind of thing, and he self-narrates, and he, what is that when you look at the camera, breaks the third Breaks wall, the fourth wall. Fourth wall or what, he does that a lot uh, <clears throat> in it as well, but I think you might enjoy it. If you ever get an opportunity, you're sitting down with your, you know, your nice beverage, adult beverage there. Now, my favorite... <clears throat> Excuse me. My favorite detective story mm -hmm. series of that era was Rockford Files. Rockford Files, yeah. I I thought um, no, James Rockford. Garner was was perfect for that. Yeah, that was a good good series. I remember that. I enjoyed it. Uh, movie wise, okay. What's like your favorite <clears throat> time movie? My favorite style movie, um, thriller. No, your just your favorite all time movie. Ooh. Well, let me do it this way. There are movies that if they come on, I can't turn them off. Okay. So there, to, to do one would be difficult. Apollo 13 is one. Oh, yeah. um, Tombstone with Kurt Russell is another. There are so many quotable lines out of, out of that. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Crimson, uh, Crimson uh, Phoenix. Crimson, Crimson Tide? Was that the football, the, the football movie or the submarine movie? Submarine movie. Uh, the one with um, Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman. Okay, it's Crimson Tide. Yeah, I think it is. Okay, Crimson um, something. But I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, I, I guess that's the. And there are others. I I love To Kill a Mockingbird, which is is not that's not something you watch over and over again. Die Hard, this, the the one with Samuel L. Jackson, <clears throat> which I think was where he he plays, like New York or something. Yeah, and and Samuel L. Jackson is is Zeus. The, yeah. The uh, I just love Samuel L. Jackson. He's just good in everything. Oh, in the John Wick movies, I am addicted to the John Wick. Okay. Movies. I think that that as as impossible and over the top as we all know it is, I there's something about that the John Wick world with the with the club. And, oh yeah. Uh, you know, and and the rules of engagement and and, um, the and actually the, with the hotel and the coins. Yep. Yeah, that that's great. Now I was gonna also ask um, when I was asking you about the gun site, uh, who who else have you trained with, or like cool places have you gone to to get some of your data for your your books? Well, when I was at Gun State Academy, my pistol instructor was Rob Latham, which is getting any better than that. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty good. Um, I will never be that good. I just. I will, I will just never be that good. And he's top 1%. And um, who else have I, uh, the, whoever is, oh, the, the lead instructor for the SEAL team combat, the Devru compound in Virginia Beach. I trained with him for a couple hours. Um, the lead instructor for the SWAT team at um, FDLA, FDLE uh, in Florida. I've been very lucky you know, to to stumble into good pistol instructions. Yeah, well, I just wish I just wish I it it took better. You know, it's I am <laughs> I am fine at you know twelve fifteen yards and um, first well, shots are guaranteed. It's like anything; the more you do it, you know, the better you're going to get at. How often That's do right. you go to the range? You know, I used to go more often than I do now. Um, yeah. COVID. Uh, but yeah. there's at, at the new house, first of all, I can, say. I, I can shoot in my backyard if I want to, 
but there's also is, is Isaac Walton League a thing everywhere? Or is that a is that a Eastern Virginia thing? I'm not familiar with it. Some okay. artists are, I'm sure. It's a there's that's within two miles of my house, and it's it's this gorgeous shooting club. I don't know how many acres they've got. A lot. Uh, but they, they've got rifle and pistol and carbine and all that. And so it's, it's a membership that's pretty affordable. And um, so I intend to join that. And then it'll become part of my certainly weekly routine. So speaking of that, what is your next, uh, once you get that next big fat check, or I'm just kidding on that, but it's on your, it's on your radar right now. It's like, as soon as I get the opportunity, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy that. It could be a gun. It could be a piece of kit. It could be vehicle. It could be anything. I want to be a typewriter. Well, no, <laughs> no. I've spent too many times on typewriters. I'm done with it. Yeah, yeah. I would like an old school coach gun. One of those ah. short barrel, you know, double, and, double barrel. Yeah. And I, and I, and I want it to be hammered, you know, it's, yeah. the, it's just something that I would like to add to the collection. Have you seen those, the, the pistol ones that they make, the, so they're not yes. a sawed off, you know, it's not an SBR and it's not a, it's just a firearm is what they call it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in that gray area. And I've seen a couple of companies that have, you know, have that have come out with those. Oh. I like the, I don't know how many guns I have in my collection. I'm not a collector. Uh, I know people who are collectors. I'm, yeah. I, you know, it's one of, the, there's a quote out there. That says my greatest fear in life is that after I die, my wife will sell my guns for what I told her I paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, it happens every time. Oh. But um, so you want a stage? I, you want a stage coach gun, shotgun? Oh. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think um, maybe a, a, a stag's leg, uh, three fifty seven magnum. You know. Yeah. Uh, lever action kind lever of lever action. Yeah. Yeah. That might That's scratch cool. that itch too. It's kind of cool. Uh, uh, I've been, I've been hooked on the, uh, the Westerns lately, the, and specifically the spaghetti Westerns. Okay. I used to watch those a lot growing up and I just, for some reason, I guess I saw one on one of these streaming things. I started watching it and now I've just, that's all I watch, um, in the evenings now is I watch some kind of spaghetti Western. And you know they've got a lot of those stagecoach guns and the lever actions and mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I've really been enjoying those. So laws be damned, rules be damned, you know money be damned. What would you own? And I know you just built your your dream house, so exclude that because you've got that already checked off your your bucket list there. Not necessarily a firearm. It could be anything. It could be anything. What would I There's own? no no laws preventing you from it. There's no money preventing you from it. I would <clears throat> I would I would have a plane and a pilot. Okay. To take me wherever I want to go when I want to go there without a mask. We are almost <laughs> you're almost getting that anyway. So, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Um get the uh the John Gilstrap G you know, Gulf Stream. <laughs> there, yeah, yeah. That's that's again. Couple more movie deals. There's always hope. Is there a certain type of business? Certain type of plane that you would have, and would you have it kitted out a certain way? I would have it kitted out in luxury. I've I've reached that stage in my life that um, I, I like to go from place to place and and do it well. Um, that I I'm not a car guy. I own a Jeep. I love my Jeep. Yeah. Um, Wrangler, kind of basic, um, and that's fine for me. I'm not a boat guy. In fact, I get seasick, so boats uh, are kind of out. Um, that's weird. You don't get, but you don't get sick on a plane. No, I don't. And I, I really don't like heights. I don't mind being high, heights. like in an airplane, but like it, you get to a railing. If I can see, yeah, down. Yeah. As long as I got that thing they got at the Grand Canyon, that plexiglass platform or whatever it is, it goes out and you can look straight down. Oh, uh, no throw way. up. No way. No way. I could do that. I'd be crawling. Exactly. <laughs> I hate that. I was just, um, we were just in Albuquerque for, for Christmas. And uh, was that the Rio Grande? Mm -hmm. What it is? They had like the, an overlook. Huh? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, whatever. It's one of those big 
uh, it's not the Grand Canyon, but you know, it's a big uh, opening in the world. <laughs> and they have these walkways where you can go. And I went out, you know, and you know, just kind of very gingerly peeked over the side. And I was like, all right, I've seen it. Um, that's enough for me. Forget that. That tingly feeling at the base of your gut that tells you that this is a bad idea. Yeah, all yeah. the hairs. Uh -huh. No thanks. <laughs> I hate that. Hate heights. Um. So, so you would buy a plane. You wouldn't put any like missiles or uh, thirty no, cal on it or anything like that. Fifty cal's. Well, maybe that would be on my dune buggy. Okay. I'd have my plane kitted out too with some kind of defensive. All right. What you think? So you so you got to put a landing strip in your backyard now for your big your big Gulf Stream. That's a lot of trees have to go down, but yeah, okay, all right. If I can afford one, I can afford hey, the. You got the money. That's right. That's right. You got the there money. Go. There's no laws preventing you from doing it. You'll just make a cabin out of those trees. Screw it. I'll buy an airport, and then I can. Oh, no, now it. you're thinking. Yeah. Now you're thinking on other people in the past. Is I would buy an island, and it would have mini guns all around it. And I would have a shooting range there, and I would have this boat. I could come and go, and I'd have a helicopter. And it's like now they get the question. That's perfect. All right, this will be the last one. Last question. If you could spend the day at the range with anyone, alive, dead, or fictional, or it could be a group of people, who would you like to spend the day at the range with? John Wick. <laughs> John Wick, just like that. Or Keanu Reeves. There you go. Interchangeable. You know, I've heard nothing but nice things about him. I, I don't, I've never met him. I have no idea. But everything I read about him is is nice. And we've all seen the video of him in his training. I and mean, he's got wicked skills. So that, I yeah. think that'd be fun. Okay. So you'd have, you'd have Keanu Reeves and John Wick. The same person. They're interchangeable. Well, they're not because one's a character and one's, so you have the John Wick character there and then you have Keanu Reeves there. Two different people. Okay. John Wick would be more interesting. Okay. Oh, you could have a group of, you have them both. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fine. That's what we'll do. Done. I like it. I like it. So that training that he did uh, with Taryn Butler, have you ever been there? I have not. No. Okay. I would think that that would be some place that you might check out and go visit a man of your stature. Yeah. Given the opportunity, I'll go anywhere. You know, you go. I, <laughs> I, I think all it takes is an invitation and I'm there. Takes All it takes is an invitation. And, you know, I will. I'll shoot any stupid gun. Um, the um, I actually own, you haven't asked the question, but it's the stupidest gun I own is a North American Arms mini revolver. In How did you know Magnum. that was one of my questions? Is it one of your questions? It is. And I just, oh, okay. Because I, I was just like, ah, he, he don't have a stupid gun. Because, you know, it's, it's this big and <laughs> it, it kicks like a, a mule, but the fit and finish on those, those guns is so amazing. And, um, but I carry it periodically. It's a good vest gun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's accurate to however far you can point it accurately, right? Um, well, I actually got a laser sight for it, which is really, yeah, I did. So, because there are no, you can't aim, barely fit it in your hand, right? So, yeah. well, that's for uh, more close range type. It's a belly gun. Yeah. Yeah. Poke them in the belly. Boom, boom. Get out of my way. So, you carry that quite often. Now, I understand you're a Glock guy. I am a Glock guy. I am a Glock guy as well. That's that's my preferred firearm. It's not that, you know, I'm just hog heels over Glock. It's just that's the one that fits my mitts the best. It fits my hand. I it the it just it shoots well. It's reliable. You don't have to. You don't. I am a gun cleaner, uh, just because I actually enjoy the process of breaking apart and cleaning them. I, I know guys. I, I know guys that have never cleaned their, their Glocks. Gunny was one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Arlie Army. Mm -hmm. Never cleaned his. He had thousand, like 5,000 rounds through his. And he's like, never cleaned it once. Still runs great. This is my EDC. It's a Gen 519. I've got a threaded barrel, extended barrel, enforced light on it. I've got these things that I put on here. This is from a company called Arachna Grip. Mm -hmm. If you can see it or not. Um, but it's kind of like sandpaperish, right? Gives okay, a, yeah. Gives you a little better grip on your your slide when you're racking it. And everybody can see I cleared it; it's not loaded. Mm -hmm. 
So don't anybody send me any mail about it. <laughs> um, which is yours? Which which Glock do you like to carry? The 42, which I bought before the 43 was available. I kind of nope. wish I had which wish I had waited. And I also carry a honor defense honor guard in yeah. uh, nine millimeter. Uh, I'm I'm not a I, I'm not a very big guy. I'm like, you know, five nine. So the 19 is just too big for me to conceal. It it doesn't it doesn't fit me well. Yeah. Um but the 42 do you carry or do you uh, appendix carry? How do you carry? Somewhere it, between two and three o'clock. Okay. And and unless I'm going to be walking around a lot and then it might slide around to four. Um but it's appendix carry if it some guns fit when you're sitting and some guns don't, you know, I don't, I don't like to have that digging feeling in the top of my thigh. Yeah. Well, I was, I used to do the, the 17, but it was too long mm -hmm. and it would jab me in the, in the nads. So I went to the 19 and it, it fits fine. And I, I appendix carry. Okay. Um, now when I'm doing training and stuff like that, you know, on the gun, gun belt and doing the rigs and all that, obviously I'm doing it from the side and, you know, different things like that. Now, I'll tell you something that I have never been trained on. All the training I've done is always from a uh, an outside waistband exposed holster. So okay. the whole business of lifting the garment and drawing and firing, you know, I do that with a cert gun or I'll do dry fire, but I've never actually, and most ranges don't let you do that. Uh, they, they get upset. Yeah. So, that that whole cycle is something I would be interested in training in. I was going to say that is definitely a training course. You need to you need to train the way you carry. Right. For for EDC. Well, it's always so. where I carry. It's just not you don't have the cover garment and all that kind of stuff. Right. You're, but to but getting used to that garment and I know the ins and outs that can go with you know a vest. You know, wearing a vest that day or a jacket or you know something along those lines. It's you definitely should do that. Uh, if you get the opportunity and you're up in uh, West Virginia. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of places that. Uh, oh yeah. There's one. Um, some training in. Oh God. He's going to kill me for not um, remembering the name plug. of his. Give I know, plug. I know, I know. <laughs> CR Newland is the guy that owns it. And it is, um, I, you know, as soon as this is over. I'm, I'm I'll look him up. CR Newland. Yeah. He's, he's the owner of, uh, of the range. Spell his last name. N e w l i n. Oh. N e w l i n c r. Yeah. C dot r dot. Great guy. He's up in West Virginia. Yeah. We'll give him a plug here. Let's see. He'll uh, give you a free class. <laughs> Echo Valley Training Center. Echo Valley, that's the one. Ba boom. Yep. There you go. It's it's massive, and you can do. He's got old cars and school buses and shit just parked everywhere. And if if you want to shoot at it, you can shoot at it. He's got a long range rifle course that uh, you can do. The facility itself is used a lot for SWAT training and and that kind of stuff. Um, but I go out there, and, and my son and I will go out there and and run through the whole arsenal. It's it's a great place. Let's see, this is on LinkedIn. CR Newland, owner, Echo Valley Training Center. See if he's got a link to his website here. He's got to uh, do better on his LinkedIn, putting putting links to his website. So anyway, our listeners that are up in that area, check out CR Newland, Echo Valley Training Center. It's a good good tip from John there. Very good. And it's an old school shooting range. You are your own um, RSO. It, it's yeah. the individual ranges are set up. So you have the whole the whole horseshoe. I like know. those. It's got a couple of those around here where I live uh, in Murfreesboro. There's one called Owl Creek or no, OK Corral. It's called OK Corral. And it's one of those where you self police and, you know, do all that stuff yourself. And you can do the you know, the, mm -hmm. the train and all that stuff the, on their pistol ranges. Very good. Is there anything else that we need to talk about uh, as far as what's coming up with with you, John? Uh, books, uh, you got signings coming up that... Uh, COVID. 
you know, so no, there are no, oh, you know, if we were talking about, um, I am happy to give away a couple of books. You have, oh, to, figure yeah, out, you have to figure out the, the mechanics of, of what people have to do to, to get them. And no, they, 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 they the autographs they and everything. All right, so they posted a question. So let's go to our listener questions here. And this is how we do this is how we do it on this show, and the leadheads know it. Is you have to participate when I do do things and ask for your participation, uh, and then you have to listen. I don't contact the winners; they have to listen to find out if they won or not. So, Aha. if they don't listen, then I'm not going to contact them. We'll give it to somebody else. Um, so here we go. Let's go to our 21 comments here i think that that one and i think brian would really enjoy one of your books uh he's he's the one who asked uh i'm assuming by the subject matter you're a prepper how have your uh, preps changed mm -hmm. between 2019 and today i think that was a pretty good question i agree and, and i know that he will enjoy the book and then he will also share it with me when he's done so <laughs> let's let brian uh, win one of your books. Which book do you want to give away? Um, Blue Fire. Blue Fire? Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, Brian, contact me. Email talkingleadgmail.com. Let me know what you won and what episode it was and send me your contact info. And then we're going to be also giving away uh, a letty, one of our letties. It's not going to be this one in particular, but it's going to have our our logo back here on it. We have our classic logo from our guys over at Dipstick that do our and we call these Letties, John. They're not they're not Yetis, they're Letties. Ah, keeps your drink seconds colder than a Letty. The talking, <laughs> the talking Letty. But it's not made from lead. It's safe to drink out of. It's well, I'm. <clears throat> I'm not going to say <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, 20 years from now when people, they find that these cups are causing people to die, then you drink at your own risk, but you can, you can put your favorite beverage in there and it will keep it cold. How about, and here's, here's a question. We didn't ask this one. How often do you do book signings? And I guess it's dependent, like you said, on this crazy uh, environment that we're in now, but a lot of people have lifted their COVID restrictions, especially in this, this part of the country, and it's not been that way for a long time. When life returns to normal, and hopefully it will in June when the next grave book comes out, <clears throat> what you need to do, anybody needs to do for a book signing is contact your local bookseller um, it, or reach out to me with the name of your local bookseller. I don't actually bring the books. The bookseller has to bring books in. Um, right. And to get them involved. And if you give me the uh, John at John is is my email address and I will forward it to my publicist in uh, New York. They'll reach out and OK and make that happen if it if it can be made to happen. There you go. Very good. So tongue for twisting. Uh, is this guy's Instagram name? So tongue for twisting. Shoot me an email talking at gmail .com. And let me know what you won, which you won one of the ladies, and I uh, need your contact info. I need a place to send it. Uh, and we're going to give away, is that any other books? Is that what we're doing there, that one? or? Yeah, we'll do Blue Fire again. Okay, we'll do another Blue Fire. How about, were there any of the questions that I asked you that uh, you particularly were fond of? Me? Yeah. I, I've enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, okay. Oh, I meant from from our listeners. I meant from our listeners, not mine. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> not oh. Mine. I I think the the prepper question and how has it the the assumption that I am one and then how has it changed? Um, it's intriguing because that's one that's never been asked before. Oh, okay. Well, he won a book, so he's right? not going to win two. <laughs> how about uh, AKM Archer? He asked several questions. Uh, he wanted to hear some EMT stories, which we we told some EMT stories. Uh, he also asked about the apocalyptic writing. What drew you to the post-apocalyptic writing? Um, let's see. He had another best story from being a powder monkey. I mean, explosive <laughs> safety expert. <laughs> I think, yeah, the accidental detonation of 1,500 pounds. We did that. 
yeah, that's yeah, we talked about that too. So I, yeah, I think he'd be a good uh, okay for that book. So A K M Archer, email me talking at gmail dot com. Tell me what you want, what episode. Need your contact info. Uh, and I just saw this one. This was one posted since we uh, started recording. Here it says, I've never read one of your books. Looking forward to your interview. What is your biggest grammar pet peeve? Mine is, quotes, me and Lefty instead of Lefty and I. So, <clears throat> Corey Brown asked that. Like, he always asks crazy questions. Like is the, like, so we, like, went like. to, like, down to the store and, and, like, we did the, like, buy things, like, it, it just makes me crazy. Like nails on a. Yep, yep. Was it or was Wait a minute. It's it? Tell me what to... it actually was, not what it was like. Okay, just be be specific. Nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> I have several of those uh, pet peeves myself, but that one, me and Lefty and Lefty and I, that he, the example he gave, that depends on how you're using it in the sentence and to which way that you would use that. Um. Well, it could be Lefty. Join Lefty and me for the podcast is correct. That was correct. Exactly. Right. Not Lefty and I. Lefty and I went to the store. Not Lefty and me went to the store. Because the rule, if you took out everything but I, and if I is the I went to the store, mm -hmm. then that's when you use it. Right. You wouldn't or, say join I yeah. for the podcast. You join me. Right. So then that's when you would say Lefty and me. So. Yes. Like it's it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's like the coolest thing like ever. It's like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to give away one of these. And I think Danny Bronson's going to win this one. Have you had any issues with publishing and advertising being pro gun? I have not. Um, every now and then, back when we, I would do book events, the, you'd get kind of an anti-Second Amendment person. You know, actually, it's not. It's not even that. It's just how aren't you concerned that guns kill children? You know, it's that kind of that kind of loaded question. And there, yeah. there's so there's so much that's wrong in the logic that goes to the asking of the question that it's it's really hard to answer. Yeah. Um, but I. I go out. I usually say something like, "There's Do so you much try to wrong." Answer something like that. I never ignore them. You know, it's yeah. it's um, in a public environment. You know, I, all eyes are on me. People can ask questions from the back of the audience, but I'm yeah. I'm the one that's stuck. Which is actually exacerbated by the. I've done a lot of these Zoom events where people are in the audience, but they're not on camera. I'm always on camera, right. and you'll get some of these off the wall uh, and politically. Um, agenda driven type questions and i either tell them that that's really outside the scope of um what we're here to talk about yeah. or uh, probably the best way to handle it there one of them asked me this was just recently it was on it was actually on crimson phoenix on the previous victoria book about um gender appropriation of man writing about a, a woman and don't and, and what kind of efforts do i make about for inclusivity and you know, all this. And uh -huh. I said, You're, I don't write about any of that. I write about people. It's yeah. like people doing interesting things. Yeah. And and the rest of it, the rest of it is on you. That's not, it's there. People uh, pe write about people who love their families and, and try to make things happen. The, the, you know, there have the, been authors in the past that assume, what is it called? The pen name? Pseudonym. A pseudonym with their doing like, you know, a female writing about a male or a male writing about a female, they'll, you know, they'll change your name. I guess I'm, I'm kind of glad you didn't do that for this, this book. You're just, Hey, I'm John Gilstrap. And this is the story I'm telling about a lady who's, you know, surviving this post-apocalyptic world. It's a lot of damn hard work to write a book. I'm getting credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. I'm not going to give some fictitious name, the credit for my hard work. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate um, the fact that you are, and I know you get a lot of flack, I'm sure, 
being in that industry, being a, I'm not going to say a second amendment proponent, a gun proponent, but just being a constitutional lover of America lover, you know, you love mm-hmm. America, you love the freedoms that it offers and you are definitely exercising your right to free speech uh, and to your second amendment, which protects all of our other amendments. And uh, for you to do it in the the environment and the industry that you are in. Um, and I know that you probably do take a lot of flack on these book signings and Maybe you've missed some some of these movie deals or something because you know of your stance, uh, which is sad. Um, hopefully, it's not due to that. Um, but I would I would never know if, if right they would never so. say yeah they would never they would never tell you. Um, but you are my hero and you deserve a, a ride on Lead Force One uh, for the work that you are doing. So I greatly appreciate it, and I look forward to getting hooked on your books. I thank you. I hope I hope you enjoy the ride, and well, I hope I, I hope Lead Force One has a luxurious interior for me to ride oh, in. Right, son, can, French, you know, uh, Corinthian leather. Oh wow! Okay. The wet bar. You know, we've got a cook. There's a cook on Lead Force One. Wow. Uh, it's it's to the nines. <laughs> you just tell us, uh, you know, beforehand what you want your beverage of choice to be. Okay. It'll be stocked. I I appreciate that. Have your favorite movie on. Tombstone will be playing 24 <laughs> 7. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of my favorite movies, too. You know, and a lot of people get into the debate of well, Wyatt Earp. You know, I, I like Wyatt Earp, Tombstone, because you know, they came out at the same time. They're about the same uh, subject matter. Uh, but you don't hear as much about Wyatt Earp as you do Tombstone. Wyatt Earp was just not as quotable, and it was way, way, way too long. Well, it was Kevin Costner, <laughs> for, for one. He's who's very dry and droll. Yeah, but you can't you can't diss Kevin Costner. He's also John no, Dutton no. on Yellowstone. So I was gonna say, I, and I was gonna I was gonna preface that, but there are roles that he does remarkably well in Yellowstone. Yes, definitely was made for Kevin Costner. I love I love that show. Have you watched all the seasons? Yeah, I mean it's it's. I, I can't, and that, now I got to wait another year. So it, it was one of those that people kept telling me, you need to watch it, you need to watch it, you need to watch it. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to watch it because I'll get hooked on it. <laughs> if I want to wait till they got at least two seasons out, because I'll binge it at that point. So I did, I think, three se- I waited till season three, and then I started watching it. And yeah, Beth That's, is what hooked me. Of course. Yeah. But is it, well, I've seen T-shirts or yeah, T-shirts that say, "What would Beth do?" <laughs> <laughs> she she would just bite their head off. There you go. <laughs> she is she is mean. So, John, it's been a pleasure. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, again, your website where people can go, JohnGilstrap.com, and that'll take you to books and uh, Facebook page and to YouTube channel and everything. So, JohnGilstrap.com. Yeah. And you're not on Instagram. That I, I haven't I have an Instagram account, but okay. I don't really understand how to use it very much. So I got you. Well, I was trying to tag you in our our stuff, uh-huh. and I was like, mm, I don't know if that's him or not, so I better not do it. And you didn't have to... a link. You didn't have a link on your Facebook or no. uh, your website. I just I don't I don't populate it. It's like I have a you um Twitter account too, but I don't. I saw the Twitter. Yeah, I saw that Twitter one. Uh, so so leadheads, go check him out. Uh, you winners, talkingled at gmail dot com. Shoot me the email. Let me know what you want and your contact info, and we'll get that out to you. Make sure you go and support those that make this show possible, Mission First Tactical, and that's uh, missionfirsttactical.com. Leadhead is the code there, 20% off, seal1.com. Leadhead also, the code there, 25% off. 1776 United is where you're going to get our awesome T-shirts that have our logos on it and our patches with Leadhead Brigade. And the shirts, Talking Lead is the code there. You get 20% off. ASP USA, they are still offering discounts to you, Leadheads. Uh, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with ASP? They make like the handcuffs and the batons that police. Yeah, I actually have one of those lights. Okay, and they make these awesome flashlights. Dual fuel flashlights would be great for uh, prepping, for preppers, because it uses different types of batteries, uh, and you can USB charge these things too. So uh, I've got several of them. This one right here is my little pocket EDC, the Garda, is the Mm -hmm. one I use here. 
Love it. ASP USA. It's ASP dash USA. And uh, you, there's a link on my website to all these. So you can go to my website or you can go directly to their sites. Leadhead, all caps, 15% off. Factory 47 for our AK corner, logoed uh, apparel, cups, and things. Leadhead, 10% off. Defiant Munitions, if you need some ammo, they've got a great line of ammo there, pretty much any caliber that you're looking for standard-wise. You can get it Defiant Munitions. Leadhead, all caps, 10% off. Medicine in bad places, use the code LEADHEAD20, you get 20% off. So if you're building that IFAC kit, John, you need some medical supplies mm -hmm. uh, for your, your prepping needs, you can go to Medicine in Bad Places, use that code LEADHEAD20, get 20% off there. Uh, and then now our new thing with Keltec, LEADHEAD, uh, lowercase, 15% off anything at their pro shop on their website. Um, so that does it. So go show them love on their Instagrams. Let them know that you heard about them here on Talking Lead. Check out John and all his awesome books. He's got more than just those that we talked about there. I definitely want to check out the one about the rescue. Um, Jonathan Grave? No, not Jonathan. Oh, no, Six Minutes to Freedom. Six Minutes to Freedom, yeah. That sounds like that's going to be a really good book, too. I'm um, going to check that out as well. Uh, but again, thank you so much, John. You're welcome back anytime. And right, thanks for can, having me. It's been a lot of fun. We can meet up at the range sometime. That'd be great. Uh, you would be the person that I'd want to spend the day at the range with. Ah, thank you. There's, there's my answer. So I've got this sign off that I do. I'll say, as always, lead heads keep your loved ones close. And then my guest will say, and your firearms closer. And then put like a spin on it with what you do maybe one of your books or something maybe jonathan grave would say or okay something like that so, so until then lead heads as always keep your loved ones close and your firearms closer put your stand on. Load your guns. oh you got... <laughs> and your 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 Jonathan Grave novels uh, at your bedside or something like that. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. See what, I'm, see what I'm getting at? I do. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as always, Leadheads, keep your loved ones close. And your firearms closer and keep a book by your bedside. I recommend anything with John Gilstrap's name on the spine. I like that. That's good. Very good. You did a good job, man. Awesome. You survived. Well, thank you. Lead podcast marathon how do you say it was it was a lot of fun you're very good at what you do and and, and i do a lot of these things and uh the not so much with this